it's a joint this webinar series is a joint uh, webinar <laughs> between AIC and ANN. AIC is the Aquaculture Innovation Center here in Singapore. It's a, con it's a center of innovation funded by ESG Enterprise Singapore and is a consortium of 11 members. We have uh, universities, institutes of higher learning and supported by SFA, Singapore Food Agency, as well as uh, TOL and NTU and US and the other polytechnics and SIT. So uh, it's a center that we provide services for the farmers and all the industry together is complying with addressing meeting the government target for 30 by 30 providing 30 percent of the nutritional needs by 2030. So we provide services research and contract research um, and then we, in May, we were approached by ANN, which is the Aquaculture Nutritionist Network, to do this joint webinar series. Uh, so we have today uh, Kabir, Dr. Kabir and Albert, they are the main founders of this ANN, the network that is mainly based in LinkedIn, but we have many over 5,000 members, including uh, researchers, students, farmers, feed millers, and all people interested in aquaculture nutrition and how we can do it sustainably. And we bring different, we invite different speakers every month. So this month, we have uh, the honor to have Dr. Brett Glancross. So he will give us, uh, before I go into, we go to the presentation, I will ask a little bit from the panelists, Kabir and Albert, and as also Brett to introduce a little bit, talk a little bit of yourselves, who you are, where you come from. Uh, maybe we start with uh, Kabir, then Albert, then we go to Brett. Sure. Uh, I was I was uh, to thank to thank you, Fanny, and I also I, I would like to thank Rongxin in the background. You see, uh, Rongxin's background is helping us. Uh, uh, so, you know, I'm Kabir. I was born in Bangladesh. Uh, got out of Bangladesh about 25 years ago. Was in Thailand for three years, then moved to Canada about 22 years, 23 years ago. And now I'm trying to be back in the region and uh, working for Jeffrey Nutrition uh, as, as well, taking care of their sufficient business uh, and uh, ANN. And this is kind of talking with Titans, kind of uh, interesting stuff that we started together. And we hope a brighter, brighter future actions and activities. Thank you. And thank you also, Brett, to, to, to agree to participate in this uh, session. Hopefully we can do some more stuff together in the future. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> good morning, good evening, uh, wherever you are. Uh, my name is Albert Tacon. I'm also a, a nutritionist of sorts. Um, together with Kabir, we thought this would be a good idea to have a platform, a forum where nutritionists, especially people working within the industry, could exchange ideas in a, in a practical and open way. Um, we don't charge any money. This is an open forum, you know, so it's, uh, um, so we hope it's going to be useful. And we are so honored to have probably one of the top nutritionists in the world going to give a presentation now, Brett. Um, and I think what's really important is that, although his, his background was on, uh, I think it was pig nutrition. You know, he learned very, he was a very fast learner. And at the end of the day, he's, he's a grown into one of the world's most prolific uh, nutritionists. And so I think we're really honored to, to have him with us today. I was going to tear there, Albert. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> really? Good. Um, well, I'm, I, maybe I won't talk too much about myself, uh, other than as I guess in the, the, the far distant past and background. But because uh, I, in the presentation, I'll 
I'll go through some of the journey that that Albert alluded to. Um, now I'm, I'm Australian by birth, um, but I've spent most of my life wandering the planet. Uh, my father used to be a foreign aid worker, so I grew up as a kid in Spain and then grew up as a kid in China. Uh, in between coming back to Australia, and then uh, as I got older, my parents moved to Turkey. I went to university, uh, and then I sort of did university all over Australia, moved around. But I've never lived the same place for more than five years of my life. I've always moved. In fact, where I am now, which is Scotland in the United Kingdom, is actually the longest place I've ever lived in one place for my entire life. So it's, uh, I'd like, I don't think I'm certainly putting down roots or anything, but um, it's, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a different feeling, this sedentary life. Um, but yeah, so lots of different perspectives, lots of different sort of um, experiences opportunities um it, it's that to me it's that change which often gives you the spice of life that's sort of i guess part of what i'm hopefully going to be talking a bit, a bit about today so may i ask a question Brett? sure uh, <clears throat> as you said in, in your early childhood right you moved around from countries to countries and you're exposed to different culture how did it shape your future right how did it shape today's bread I think probably the, the key thing, if I try to reflect on that, Kabir, is that for me, change is normal. You know, the, the idea of staying in one place forever terrifies me. You know, <laughs> almost as soon as I move to one place, I'm looking at where's the next place to go to? You know, you arrive one place, oh, this is great, where's the next place, you know? Yeah. And that's, it's that, that itchy feet feeling that, you know, that you're a perpetual nomad. Uh, it, it annoys the hell out of my wife. Um, she spent the first 23 years of her life living in the same house, let alone moving the same from the same city. But uh, she, she's she's tol tolerated my my behaviour quite well for 25 years, and uh, come along for the ride. Um, but that but that'd be the main thing I think could be. It's just that you, that when you you go into organisations and everyone talks about change management, I've always sort of going, well, what's what's the issue? You know, change is normal, isn't it? That's what we should be doing. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's, it's when it's, it's often if I look at my career and the times when I, when I get really itchy and I want to leave, it's usually when I've been there for a while and things are getting easy. You know, I've got all the labs set up, I've got the team set up, I've got the grants set up. It's you know everything's cruising and thinking, all right, it's time to go now. Um, you know, I I like because I I like I like working with my hands, I like building things. I don't like delegating work. I like. <laughs> Being involved in the front line at the coalface, um, you, you, you talk to any of my students and they'll say, oh, yeah, Brett was in there basically every step of the way from the beginning of the trial to the end of the trial. You know, we had to tell him to piss off half the time. Um, <laughs> my, my technicians are the same. Brett, what are you doing in the lab? Get out of here. Yeah. Oh, but this is the fun bit. You know, why should I yes, write yes. all these grants and then let you have the fun? You know, I want to have play too. <laughs> um, but, yeah, it's yeah, it's been an interesting Ride so far. I mean, I guess if you look at chronologically, I'm supposed to be only about halfway. You know, even I've only just yep. turned 50, so right. still got another 15 years to go, I guess. Right. Yeah. Hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very good. Thank you, everyone. So for this webinar, you will have we will have a presentation by Brett about 30 to 35 minutes, and then we will have a Q&A session. Mm, it will be, we try to make it more informal, not so formal, so, yeah. Uh, so I just do, uh, I do, I just said do for, less formal, but I do a formal introduction of our presenter. <laughs> so Brett, he was, uh, he has a master's from Western Australia, Uni University of Western Australia on biochemistry and a PhD on animal nutrition from University of Queensland. Then currently he's the technical director of IFO, I -F -F -O. since June 2021. Uh, IFO is the international trade organization that represents the marine ingredients industry. And he has been, before that he's been the professor of nutrition at the Institute of Aquaculture at uh, the University of Stirling in Scotland. 
So for the past 25 years, he has been uh, working with farms and farmers, feed industries, feed company throughout Asia, Oceania, Middle East and Europe. And today's talk, he will do a synthesis of what he has been, as he's mentioned, not intentionally, but he became um, a specialist in ingredient assessment kind of and then uh, let's say <laughs> uh, and then um, so he will do a summary of because he has published two other papers previously and then today's presentation will be a summary for what he has been through this what he has seen this last 25 years and what he has so his thoughts for the future for the coming future so Kabir, would you like to say anything before uh, no. we start? No, just uh, uh, like uh, questions. If you have any questions, type it in the chat box and we will try to address the questions at the end of the session together. Okay. Yeah, so, we will have uh, uh, maybe around half an hour, 45 minutes of Q&A after the presentation. So questions, if you can type in, if we cannot ask all of them, uh during this session we will make sure we send to brad and we send the reply later on so that all questions are answered in way or the other yeah okay so without further ado it's the floor is your brad all right thank you i'll just try to change screen all right you see that all right is that the presentation there yes we can see all right Okay, as Fanny and Kabir said, what I'm going to talk a bit about today is, um, I guess it's a reflection of some of my observations on working in the aquaculture area for 25 years on the ingredient assessment side of things. And over the last five years in particular, I, I sort of developed this much more clear picture in my mind, certainly about where the role of marine ingredients sits. And I'll, I'll probably try and end on that, not just because it links with my current role, but I can sort of see that the way in which we're looking at marine ingredients is changing and needs to change. Um, but also the opportunities there are probably quite different to what people think. So it's probably worth reflecting on that. But to start the show, what I thought I'd start off with is this. As we talked about a bit in the discussion, the, the only cost of my life has really been changed. And I've sort of tried to embrace it where I can, because if you change the way you look at things, things you look at change. And to me, that's a really good expression for you know, trying to keep the world interesting around you, that if you change the way in which you perceive or face or orientate towards things, you, you, your complete picture of look, understanding what you're looking at begins to, to change, but also begins to consolidate. But maybe sort of to reflect on also what Fanny and Kabir and, and Albert were talking about, you know, it was, it was my sort of checkered past, you know, this background of change. And I'm only going to talk about my academic life here. But I, as uh, Fanny mentioned, I started my my undergraduate and my uh, first postgraduate degrees at the University of Western Australia uh, way back in the mid 90s. And I did a master's on pig nutrition. I then moved to the opposite side of Australia to the University of Queensland, although I was based at the CSIRO, which is Australia's National Science Institute where I did a PhD on omega-3 requirements in Panaeus monodon shrimp. Um, after about two and a half years of that, I then moved to South Australia, uh, working for the South Australian Research and Development Institute, SADI, where I did a postdoc managing a tuna research farm and developing tuna feeds and doing tuna environmental impact assessment work. And wasn't scientifically a high point that that role but it was it was very politically high profile in australia at the time so i, I got noticed a lot uh had was forever forever being a tour guide for various politicians and dignitaries and um senior research people from around the world um and at the change of the century i got offered a chance at the age of 28 to lead up my own research group in western australia back where i originated from so despite the reluctance to go back home i, I did because the opportunity was too too good where well, i started working on a range of things notably working with the, the grains industry western australia is the largest grain producing region in australia 
Uh, so we're working with the grain industry there to try and get applications for their oils and the meals into aquaculture feeds. But it was also about the same time that the barramundi industry was emerging and developing in Western Australia, initially at Lake Argyle and then later at the uh, Cone Bay in the Kimberley North. Um, so I was very closely involved with those two sectors as well. And then around about 2002, 2003, uh, the Australian government uh, overseas aid, uh, International Agricultural Research Centre, ACR, approached me to start doing some work in Vietnam and Cambodia. And so I started then working from about 2003 onwards uh, in Vietnam and Cambodia, working with tilapia and, and pangasius, largely doing the same thing on, on, on trying to refine feeds and evaluate ingredients for, for use in Vietnam to try and get them from feeding trash fish and mash feeds into extruded pellets. I did that for probably about another six or seven years. Then I got a bit bored. And then I left government research and went to the private sector where I was the R&D manager at a lobster farming company, looking at trying how to set up lobster farming um, for tropical lobsters. Um, while I was doing that, I got headhunted for the CSIRO, the National Science Organization, to take on a leadership role as a stream leader there for their nutrition stream. And so I moved back from Western Australia back to Queensland again, where I then spent the next six, seven years working on a range of things, um, most notably uh, thermal stress biology in salmon, as well as continuing the ODA work in Vietnam, I had a long association with Vietnam in particular, and continuing ingredient assessment, but also the development of the microbial biotech, Novak, uh, which we commercialised. Um, about halfway through that stint in CSIRO, I managed to convince my, my management that I should go and do a sabbatical. Um, so I went to Scotland for six months and absolutely fell in love with the place. Um, and, you know, a couple of years after that I came back, I, I got you know, a board working at CSIRO again. So I left government research and went back to the private sector. It's done for, to Ridley as a commercial uh, feed company. I was a technical manager. And while I was working at Ridley, uh, the role for the professor of nutrition came up at the University of Stirling uh, in 2015, where I did my sabbatical. And the wife and I thought, wow, you know, we'd always loved Scotland. Wouldn't it be great to go back and live there? So we applied for that and landed that role. And then pretty much within months of landing, I got asked to be the director of research and then uh, promoted to be the deputy director. And then I did that for two years and then thought, no, no, I actually just want to get back to getting my hands wet and dirty and playing with fish again. So I stepped down from the leadership role and went back to just being a plain old professor. But certainly at Sterling, I then got involved with a whole range of different projects and things and had a nice portfolio coming up. And of course, COVID hit. Um, and I thought, all right, getting a bit bored here now, uh, time to change. And then the IFO role came along. And that's sort of where I've come to now. It's sort of a, a period punctuated by working in different academic realms, you know, punctuated by industrial realms um, to you know, cross between the two over a period of about 25 years. What has happened through that course, though, is you can see that there's a lot of projects and areas there which in particular have had a focus on ingredient evaluation and assessment. And during that period, you know, I've, I've – conducted projects and all those different types of ingredients on the left, plant oils, cereals, lupins, and so on, um, to various degrees. Um, and it's during that course of working through that, that, you know, I've, I've made lots of mistakes and had a few wins. And during that, I've, I've also worked out that there's certain things that you need to understand to make any ingredients work. And particularly when I join the commercial feed sector, this really comes into focus because you actually need to use these things. And so you start really becoming a bit more critical about the information you get and you look at and how you actually apply it. So in some respects, it's worth reflecting on that role as a technical manager because it it really shapes your view quite differently to being as an academic and how you approach the science, particularly for ingredient assessment. That technical manager role, I had various roles in doing that, working with my, the general manager for R&D, Richard Smuller, who was a great colleague to work with. Um, but we were co coordinating on-farm trials, trials with universities like Deakin with Giovanni Ticini, trials with institutes like New South Wales Fisheries with Mark Booth. Uh, did lots of in-house work, working with you know customers as well, and a lot of customer support. So I, I was forever on the road, literally spent one week and two in that job living in a hotel somewhere. You know, if one week in six, I'd be in Northern Australia. One week in six, I'd be in New Zealand. And one week in every four, I'd be in Tasmania. 
and then in between moving around where home was at Brisbane at the time. So it was a lot of travel, very enjoyable, not great for the family life. But the other key role there was also playing logistics support. And what I mean by that is actually working with our purchaser to actually provide them advice and guidance on um, purchasing raw materials. So looking at telling them this is what we need, this is what the qualities we're after, but also doing what we call shadow costing, which is actually identifying what how much we could afford to pay for raw materials before we wouldn't use them and it would cost us money. And that would be a regular routine process that we would go through with the head formulator. Um, and the technical group to actually liaise with logistics to sort that out. And then, of course, I played a role as a formulator. Um, when the head formulator was away, I'd have to step in and formulate diets for all, all those species you got there, you know, three different types of salmonids, uh, kingfish, barramundi and shrimp. And we'd have to reformulate about 80 plus diets every month to look at what's the op optimal strategy for this month. Um, not not eight, different species, 80 different diets, but... You know, each each different species would have at least 10 different diets, depending upon which customers we're making diets for. One of the things you work out when you have to go through that diet formulation process is it's really a process of managing two information sets. First set is understanding requirements and then how we use those understanding of what an animal needs to define specifications. And that's largely where you interface with the scientific literature to understand well, what does an animal actually need? and how that work has been defined and how might you extrapolate that to set the design constraints or the design specifications for a particular feed. The other information set is the ingredient database, understanding what you've got, what it can do, what nutrients it supplies, what risks it brings and how much it costs. And then you manage this process, which is largely a risk management process through implementing a range of constraints in your formulation um, matrix. So there's just an example of my formulation window there that I use routinely all the time on the right, wind feed. And you manage one set of information on the left, the ingredients, and you manage the other information on the right, which is the nutrients, by putting in minimum and maximum constraints to then arrive at, at an idealised uh, formulation. But when you do this, there's a whole range of these constraints you have to manage, you know, nutrient constraints, anti-nutrients, processing, social attitudes, price, and so on which all feed into your decision-making process. But they're particularly important in terms of how you understand those ingredients. So when you someone comes to you and wants to sell you a new ingredient, you have to look at it in terms of that lens of those constraints. You know, what can this ingredient do within those constraints? One of the truisms that you'll find going through that process is that you'll work out very quickly that animals require nutrients and energy, not ingredients. But ingredients supply nutrients and it's that key fact that the ingredients are, are suppliers of nutrients that so you've got to work with them that is the, the the process by which formulation works the other key part of that is also knowing that ingredients tend to supply nutrients they also supply contaminants and anti-nutrients and complications and that's part of the to me the really interesting part about being a formulator is that it's that the art of how you actually apply that science in terms of ingredients, though, one of the things that we've observed, obviously, over the last 25 years, um, not only is it there's a phenomenal growth rate of the aquaculture as an industry, you know, when I joined aquaculture back in 1995, you know, we were making less than you know, 10, 10 million tonnes of feed, and it's now in, in excess of you know, 55 million tonnes of feed being made globally. And even back then in the early 90s, everyone was saying, oh, fish meal, fish oil are going to run out. You know, we, we need to find something else. Um, and so the period from about probably 2000 to 2015, marked here, you know, at the bottom in the the the, the yellow window here, has been a period of which we've seen incredible change occurring in the feed sector globally, as the industry realised, okay, the marine ingredients are finite, we've we can't expand our use there much, we've got to use other things, and so there was a a big push to look at how we actually use other things, but interestingly during that period. Marine ingredients have never gone away. They're still there, and uh, you know, the application of them, particularly in the last 10, 20 years, has largely stayed the same almost. And we're still using you know, the same amount today, about 4 million tonnes of fish meal and about a million tonnes of fish oil each year as we were for, you know, over the last 20 years. But we're very aware that we, you know, we can't really increase that resource too much. Uh, or maybe we can, and I'll talk a bit about that later. Um, but what you certainly need is we need, need new things to come to the table here to provide that nutrients. 
you know, new things to provide protein, both essential and non-essential amino acids, energy and omega-3, and probably the, the key nutrients that we need to be able to find to actually put into that those formulations. And you'll see, looking at the present day, more than 91% of the raw materials used now are actually not marine ingredients. So marine ingredients are really, from my view, a strategic ingredient. They're not really a, a, a bulk supplier of nutrients at all anymore. So what is? And there's a whole raft of different things which we can access these days, from the traditional things like anchoveta meal and northern Atlantic fish meals from herring and soybean meal, down to all these novel things like insects and microalgae and GM technologies and microbial protein. Um, and they all come with some utility, but they also also come with some challenges. So part of my role, I guess, in the last 20, 25 years was actually walking in that path. And initially, when I first started my research team in Western Australian government um, in the year 2000, my first work that I was approached to do was actually looking at working with the grains industry to say, well, what can we do with this rapeseed meal? You know, rapeseed is principally harvested for its oil, um, but what can we do with the meal? So I was asked to examine, well, how useful are the different types of meals, you know, the way in which we extract the oil, different processes for extracting the oil, either solvent extraction or expeller extraction, does that influence the quality of the meal? So we did work on that. We also did work in looking at development of protein concentrates from rapeseed. And we also started working with the sector on looking at, well, can we use rapeseed oil as, as a fish oil replacer? Um, so this was back in 2000, 2002. Um, and initially did that very first work with scratching, um, looking at saying, well, can we can we use crude rapeseed oil? It's a lot cheaper than using, say, refined rapeseed oil. And the answer was no, you've got to use the refined stuff because there's a lot of tannins come through with the, the crude oil. Um, I came back to rapeseed about a decade later, but that's a, another project, largely just re-examining some of the, the evolution of the rapeseed sector, uh, but this time with a different species, barramundi. That was as much about developing feeds for barramundi as it was about the grains industry at that time. But after that early phase one of the rapeseed work, um, I then got asked by the National Grains Research and Development Corporation in Australia to look at lupins. The lupin sector was booming about this time, and it just exceeded a million tonnes per annum production in Western Australia. And they wanted to say, well, is there any uh, you know, values in the different varieties or species of lupins? Um, could you assess that? So we did some work on that. We then started running a series of annual workshops from 2003 to 2007, I think it was, uh, looking at you know, how we could develop uh, applications or future for using grains and aquaculture feeds. And we wrote a review on lupins and aquaculture feeds uh, that's still on the web. Uh, I think you can access it from uh, some of the the, um, the 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 government website or even some of the industry websites over there. That worked quite well that that period. So I was then uh, approached by the national government to develop a national um, program, the age of 35, to lead a national research program, the Australian Feed Grants Program as a public-private consortium. So this was a bit of a new model they were exploring at the time. This is back in about 2004, 2005, uh, where we had multiple research agencies involved, the GADC, the Fisheries R&D Corporation. We had the uh, private sector in terms of CBH Group, which is a large grain handler, Western Technologies, which is a grain processor, Scretting, which is a feed company. Uh, as well as a whole range of different research agencies from around Australia. Chris Carter at University of Tasmania, David Smith at CSIRO, Stolli Resti at NOFEMA, and I was at the um, Government of Western Australia. We raised around about 1.5 or 1.25 million US to do that work and had very close industry engagement. And we had a multi-species research approach. Most of the screening work was done with rainbow trout, which we were then looking to apply offshoots from that work into some um, shrimp. And we developed, you know, um, and assessed a range of different lupin and other grains, protein concentrates particularly across those species. Um, but more notably, we had a range of sort of pertinent outcomes. Um, you know, I generally have always been more focused on what, what's the application of the work I do rather than the publication. Uh, that work resulted in Western Technologies and CBH forming a joint venture to establish the Australia's first loop and processing facility, Australasian loop and processing. Um, another smaller grain processor then established an export portfolio, exporting uh, loop and meals throughout Australia and also uh, throughout Southeast Asia as a consequence of that work. And they're 
they're both still operating those groups. Um, the, we had specialist breeds that were, were bred by the grain breeders of the uh, Department of Agriculture, specifically for aquaculture. And lupin use went from less than 100 tonnes in about 2003 to over 20,000 tonnes by 2008. It was, it was scratching, picking up most of that, um, particularly in their Chilean and Australian mills, but also they even started exporting lupins from Australia all the way to Norway. Um, we did do some science out of that. Uh, it wasn't all industry application. We did a, some really cool cross-species assessment stuff. Uh, we were able to demonstrate the absence of distal enteritis in salmon from lupins uh, because we know it occurs with soybean. We were able to demonstrate the improved functionality of pellets by through the use of lupins and proving their durability, which was a bit of a, uh, a game changer at the time. I'll talk a bit about that later. And also understanding the compositional drivers of variability. What is it that's actually the chemistry of the, the grain itself, which actually influences its nutritional value? Um, that's that coloured diagram over here to the right. And we also then started working with near-infrared reflection spectroscopy to see, well, if we... Now, know the digestibility things, can we develop calibrations to predict the digestibility of a plant protein ingredient? The answer is, yeah, you can. And that's one of the calibrations we ended up developing and publishing. So we did a range of reasonable science outcomes as well. Fast forward from there, uh, a couple of years, and, and I moved to the other side of Australia, and Novak, something you may or may not have heard about, it sort of goes under the radar a bit because even though this formed the main aspect of the work I did at CSIRO, we never really published much on it. It was very focused on driving industrial outcomes. Now, you know, there's a, probably about three papers out there and probably about 20 uh, in commercial and confidence reports. But the technology was eventually commercialised with three companies for global production distribution, Ridley's, Viet Uc and Gentech Industries in China, uh, Viet Uc in Vietnam and Ridley in Australia. Um, but it did have a strong focus on process and raw material input optimization. Um, we did patent technology. Uh, it's got some pretty amazing applications in terms of what this thing can do to actually stimulate um, shrimp performance. So you see in that simple diagram in the bottom, you know, if we have a, a high protein diet that so we feed to, to Monodon and we add Novak to it, you can see growth going up by about 50%. But we can also drop the protein from the typical 42%, which is a standard monodon diet, down to 30, you know, which, of course, almost halves the growth, but then adding the Novak in and you can recover all that growth. So it's really quite a, a, a useful metabolic modifier in terms of stimulating um, uh, growth rates and feed utilisation in shrimp. I haven't really kept up where, where that technology is at yet. I know um, Ridley's progressing uh, rollout of it, but I'm not quite sure uh, how well it's progressed. Then moving to some of the more recent work in Sterling, and then when I not long after I arrived in Sterling, um, Ifo got in touch with me uh, and said, "No, Brett, we'd be interested in you know better understanding the nutritional variability of fish meals." So we started by setting up a fish meal holotype collection, um, which last count has about forty-four samples or something in it, and we analysed those for pretty much everything we could possibly analyse at the lab at Sterling. About one hundred and fifty-nine parameters, I think it was. And we also wrote a review on the quality assessment of fish meal, uh, which is available to IFO members, but hasn't been released beyond them. Um, we were able to get quite a good coverage. We, I think we covered about um, 19 different countries and 14 different species of fish meal. Fish meal coming from whole fish meal, but also trimmings, byproduct fish meals as well. That then led to stage two of that work, which uh, continued that collection. Um, and then we also did some work evaluating some of those fish meals, uh, particularly the different species fish meals um, uh, for palatability and digestibility. And I'll explain later actually why why we focused on that. Um, and that also then allowed us to look at developing some provisional NIR calibrations for digestible protein in salmon from fish meals as well. And then that project's sort of largely finishing off now, um, but it's continuing on for some long-term oxidative and compositional stability studies. But during all these different studies, you, you sort of see over time I've bounced between different areas and different types of uh, raw materials. One of the things that we noticed is that there's certain key points of information that you needed to understand to be actually enable you to be able to use those ingredients. A lot of it came down to being able to characterise something, understanding what you were working with, what made it different from something else, where it was, and also characterising that information such that if you're going to report that information or tell somebody about it, 
they knew how to relate to it. They could actually go, okay, I know what he was working with. I can go and get the same thing. And I'll, I'll expand a bit more on that later, why that's really critically important. And unfortunately, it's a step that a lot of people seem to miss. After characterization, of course, the next point of interface with the feed is feed intake. So that's another key point to evaluate how that influences palatability. And then, of course, the animal digests it. So we usually assess digestibility. It's only once the animal to digest those nutrients, they then become available for utilisation. So that's when you might assess growth or something. And of course, the other key thing there um, is the functionality. You've got to be able to make this thing into a viable physical pellet to feed the animal. So they become important as well. There's a range of other things which we can measure. Um, um, but to me, that these are sort of add ex accessory value to the, the those core five ones. And it was that realisation of going down that path, particularly with the early grains work, making a few mistakes and then working out the right strategy that I was discussing with Jeff Allen on one trip to Vietnam back in about 2004, 2005, and we were comparing notes and the mistakes that we'd made and thought, yeah, wouldn't it be really useful if someone wrote a review on this to actually provide some guidance? So we did. And that was this review here that we wrote back in 2006, 2007. Um, then around about lockdown last year, uh, I decided to revisit that because having continued on that path since then, there's probably a few refinements. And, and it's a bit of a living story. I, I keep finding that the more and more I think about this, there's things I keep suddenly changing all the time about the way I would go around this. And, and this is sort of today's story where we're going to go and explore what the different influences or points are that influence my perspective on how I would consider using ingredient and why I think they're important. So in many respects, when we study ingredients, the studies is really as much a study of the ingredient as it is of the fish. You know, we, we need to understand what it is the material that we're working with, you know, how, what is it, what nutrients does it have and how much. How palatable is it to an animal? You know, how well the nutrients absorbed? Is there anything toxic in this thing that might inf impact utilisation? How does it impact the pelleting process? All these become just as critical as working with the animal uh, is understanding the ingredient. One of the studies that I did around about probably 10, 15 years ago was a, an evaluation of a whole range of different replacements or alternatives to fish meal and use of um, Asian sea bass, barramundi diets. And when we ran this experiment, I, I, I had evaluated all the ingredients first in digestibility studies so I could formulate all the diet to equal digestible protein and digestible energy. And then what we did is we, we felt like a normal growth study, but we then found we still got lots of variation in performance. But if you evaluate that, perform, that performance variation in terms of feed intake, you get a you know, beautiful linear relationship. What it was showing is that more than 80% of all the variation in the growth could be explained by feed intake. So I subsequently drilled in that information a bit further. We found if you use that same information and then evaluate it on a digestible energy and digestible protein basis, and uh, looking at what's the digestible energy intake, what's the digestible protein intake, we can see that those relationships get even stronger. I mean, obviously the diets were formulated to the equivalent of digestible energy and digestible protein basis, um, but you never usually get it exactly right, but you can, you can minimize a lot of that variation. But you can sort of see that in many cases, we're now getting in excess of all the 90% of all the variation associated with the performance being related to both feed intake and the and the digestibility story, which means there isn't a lot of room out there left for explaining things as a function of you know, variation, nutrient utilisation or other factors. So what you see here is actually what I'd call a hierarchy of impacts, that there's three primary points of influence when an animal interfaces with an ingredient via a feed. And they occur on a sequential basis of influence. Obviously, the animal has to interact with the feed first. And so that becomes the first point of influence. Does it choose to eat that or not? Yes or no? It then has to digest and break that feed down. And this is its secondary point of interaction with the feed. And so it's that inefficiency of that breaking of the feed down into bits that it can actually effectively absorb uh, which then goes into utilisation. That becomes your second point of influence. Um, and then it's only when the nutrients then become across the enterocytes in the gut and get into the, the uh, circulation that they really become available for utilisation. So that's really the last point of in interaction with the animal. And so we see a declining impact on performance through the sequential influence process. But what we do notice is the effects often accumulate. So if you get something that has 
bad feed intake, bad digestion, you're then going to get even worse growth. But you can have something that's good, good feed intake but poor digestion, and you can then still see quite bad growth as well, or something that has poor feed intake and great digestion and also has not so great growth as well. Um, what, what I've, you know, particularly in that, that latter review, the 2020 re review, I've sort of changed my view a little bit now to how we might characterise this process for evaluating ingredients in, in a series of steps. Step one, it's got to be this characterisation step. Uh, and this is more about so we understand equivocally exactly what we're working with and how that information can be shared and used by others. Step two is understanding those primary points of influence, the palatability and, and the digestibility. How does the animal primarily interact with the, the ingredient? And then from those steps, you can then use those bits of information to then evaluate things like utilisation, which of course then allows you to evaluate things like immune response, which is becoming increasingly important these days. But at this point, you can also evaluate the functionality uh, and how well that can be used to make the, a, a feed in a physical form. There's other things you can evaluate from those flow down processes, step four, you can look at omics responses and meat quality. And the life cycle assessment's another one that's catching my attention a bit lately. And I've sort of got this dashed line to the characterization because it could almost in some respects be considered as part of step one, but it, it's increasingly becoming a very important parameter that we're looking at now. And I'll finish the, uh, today's discussion a bit more about that, that parameter. So let's start with ingredient characterization. Now, this is critical because you can only formulate to what nutrients which have data. Now, there's an example here on the left of three different diet formulations, and this would be the bare minimum for which I would need data for to be able to formulate a diet for something. Um, you know, really you need those proximates, amino acids, fatty acids, and you can use rapid methods like NIR. They're really useful for getting this information quickly, but chemical analysis is still the gold standard in terms of getting the most accurate information to be able to characterize something. There's other analytes you could add into this, you know, minerals, vitamins, any contaminants you think might be of concern. But it's also really important that you identify what is it you're working with. You know, is it a fish meal? What type of fish meal? Where was it from? How was it processed? All these bits of information really become important in terms of um, understanding the ingredient. And in fact, it was quite ironic when I wrote that um, fish meal quality review for IFO about four years ago. I actually went and reviewed all the literature to try and get all this information about fish meal qualities from around the world. And despite that most of us, myself included, have been evaluating fish meal alternatives for 20 plus, 25 years, it was amazing how poorly characterised even the fish meal we were replacing was across the world. Very few people had even mentioned what species it was. They just said it was fish meal. But there's dozens of types of fish meals and they're processed in many different types of ways and they have very variable different qualities. Um, so that's something else we'll come back to later as well. One example of that is, this is an example here of some of the work I did on the lupins back in about 20 years ago. These were different breeds. So this is the same species of lupin, but different breeds, different genotypes, all grown in the same place in the same year. And then we process them at the, the, the government lab to make a kernel meal. That's the, the kernel on the right there. That's the whole seed on the left. So we take the seed coat off it to end up with this protein concentrated kernel meal. And you can see you're getting variation there from about 370 grams per kilogram of protein up to about 460 grams per kilogram of protein. That's a massive variation. But then there's this other point here, this Myali variety, which was samples we got of that same variety but in different locations in the same year. And you can see, you, you get that environmental variation as well. So there's a huge G by E variation in terms of raw materials. And this is just one ingredient, one species. Imagine if we went across other different types of lupin species, or then you go to soybean or rapeseed. Yeah, you can see that there's enormous variation there. The industry standard you know, was around about that 420, but you can sort of see if you were using that textbook value, you could be way under, or you could be way over, depending upon what, where, which material you actually had. So it's really important to try and understand and characterise that that, um, that that variability of ingredient you're working with. The other aspect of that is also the processing, the way in which it's processed. So here you can see the effect of lupin hulling deficiency, that removal of that seed coat. Um, and as you increasingly become more efficient at removing the seed coat, of course, the seed coat is largely to cellulose, so it dilutes out the protein. In this sample here, the protein went from about 370 grams per kilogram up to about 500 grams per kilogram. Um, but you can see that also affects the digestibility. 
it, that also affects the, how well the animal can actually utilize because that cellulose is no longer interfering with the digestion process. So you, you can not only influence the composition of the product, but you can also influence its, its, its nutritional values. After characterization, I've often thought that the next step is you need to evaluate or understand is that palatability story. Um, and this is really, I guess, comes down to you know, understanding how the animal actually uh, interacts with the food and how it is, is interested in that food. And there's different ways in which we can um, approach that story. Uh, usually it's done by feeding studies and then measuring responses to feed intake or behaviour, but there's different variations you can apply to this, to, you know, whether you're working with fish or shrimp and so on. But the way in which the animal interacts with the food, whether it removes away from it or whether it does ignores it, whether it moves towards it, whether it eats it or rejects it, tells you different things about the the chemicals within that food and the way the animal's interacting with them. And this, this can be a really important part in terms of understanding the utility of that ingredient. The other thing, this is some recent work that I've done with single cell protein, uh, is also looking at that change over time. Uh, what I've learned from doing lots of studies with palatability and growth studies in particular is uh, how animals' exposure or influence to feed changes over time. And there's a, a, real, there's a critical window in that first 10 days Days one, two, and three, the animal's usually a little bit ambivalent because it's still thinking about what it had yesterday. But by about day three, three to 10, it's starting to become very discriminatory as to does it like that or not. And this, that, this is that, that yellow window. You can sort of see here, it's telling you very clearly, you know, does it, this is the, the, the reference feed, uh, and, uh, which is basically a commercial formulation. And this is the, the test ingredient with a certain amount of single cell protein in it. You can see it didn't like that. Sometimes you might get, mm, it's a bit more ambivalent, it might be a little bit to windows, but then you can see it coming back in. So it's adapting. But sometimes they don't adapt, sometimes they do. And we used that approach uh, a couple of years ago with fish meals, for example. Um, and I can't tell you which fish meals is which in this one, other than some of them are from the commercial sector, some of them are ones that I made in the laboratory. And we compared them against single cell protein, soy concentrate, isolate and corn gluten meal. And we looked at, how well they, they uh, influence palatability. So this was a classic digestibility design where we've replaced 30% of the diet with each test ingredient to then measure the digestibility, but we also measured the palatability over that 10 day period. And we've got a whole range of byproduct and fish meals in there as well. So you can see with almost without exception, if you get a good quality commercial fish meal, they actually improve the feed intake. So they have a palatin effect, sometimes quite remarkably so. And even what we used to consider the byproducts being low grade, they're certainly not low grade. They're, they don't seem to be having necessarily uh, inferiorities to many of the, the whole fish fish meals these days. What you can see though, is if you make a laboratory made fish meal from old fish, fish that have been in the freezer for more than six months and aren't quite the best quality, is it's pretty hard to recover that, that quality or palatability, no matter how you process it. And I'll come back to that story later as well. So through that, time uh, uh, last 25 years obviously been doing a lot of digestibility work um yeah, you're probably getting a better f understanding why i've placed so much importance on it but also during that period i've tried to do a lot of work and understanding the methodology and improving the methodology around digestibility whether it's you know um looking at is the collection time important you know how long do you acclimate fish to feeds for comparing amongst different species and also comparing different collection methods you know i've used you know, the, the Schubert system in France, I've used the Guelph system um, or adaptions of the Guelph system. But most frequently, I tend to go back to stripping, largely because it it minimises the influence of the, the medium, the water, on the, the faecal integrity. And there's data here, you can sort of see that as you increase the carbohydrate content in a feed more, the, you get greater disparity between the, the data you get between stripping and settlement, which to me clearly says that the hydroscopic nature of carbohydrates is actually interfering with nutrient release in the feces, which then of course means you, you're, you're losing nitrogen basically from the feces if you use salmon. So I've preferentially generally always gone back to stripping because you can rule that point out. You're taking it from a common point through time. I've had this debate lots with Don Bureau over the years because he, he, we're both firm believers in sticking with picking one method and sticking with it. Um, but we each have our favorite methods. The other key area that I've 
like to focus there on is actually the comparison among species. And this was work that I did comparing trout with, with barramundi. And that's something I've done quite a bit of over the years is different studies looking at comparing uh, rainbow trout with lots of things. Rainbow trout was the principal lab rat that I used in Western Australia. So I had lots of experience and easy access to it. But we did work with red sea brim, uh, barramundi, Atlantic salmon. And virtually in every case, you, you find you get quite good relationships and digestibility um, among those species. And that sort of makes sense because they're generally all quite ob high order obligate carnivores and their digestive systems are quite conserved in their design. More recently, I've been doing some work with the Saudis um, and we've expanded on that. This is four species of seven species we've been working with on uh, evaluating 15 different diets we've been uh, assessing over the last four or five years there. Um, you know, we've got a mix of carnivorous species there and, so, and some omnivorous species there, but we can get some quite remarkable uh, linearity. So, see so here, the relationship here is about almost 84% between European sea bass and mega in terms of their uh, correlation. Other species, not so crash hot, say Pompano and Tilapia, um, less than ideal. Uh, but it certainly is some you know, feed for thought and it allows me to get my hands wet playing with lots of fish again. One of the things that I've learned during that process, though, is that compendiums have great utility. And frequently I would, you know, in my travels working in Europe or Middle East or Asia, uh, get asked by people, Brett, have you got any digestibility data or data you can spare? Um, and so what I've tried to do in recent years is actually publish some of these as compendiums, you know, the work on shrimp and the work on Asian sea bass. So all the data is in one place. But over the years, we've managed to develop some quite comprehensive databases and data sources on you know, digestible energy, digestible protein from a whole range of different resources, whether they're starch resources or oils or plant proteins and animal proteins. And this really allows you to do some pretty cool stuff. The other great resource in this area, they have to put a plug in for Don Bureau and the AFID, a great resource out there. Uh, if you haven't signed on to it, sign on to it. Um, I, I think it's a, it's a fantastic um, a resource. Um, and then, of course, more recently, been doing the similar stuff with ingredient digestibility with uh, Atlantic salmon and different fish meals. And you can generally see there that most of those fish meals are really quite high digestibility. Um, certainly when in the lab, what I did is took that green mackerel um, and basically either oven dried it at 150 degrees for 24 hours, which basically burnt it or freeze dried it and made it, you know, um, and then did it with frames or fillets to change the the resource type and you can sort of see that the burning has a big impact um but the the composition of the actual raw material the felt to the frames has less of an impact in terms of the protein digestibility but generally you can sort of see that there's quite a lot of commonality in terms of the digestibility of, of um, high-grade fish meals certainly less variability than what we've seen in a lot of plant resources when you have that sort of information particularly large data sets, it really is useful for developing rapid analysis strategies. One of the things that we would typically do when I was in the commercial sector is every time a batch of material would arrive, it would come across the weigh bridge, we'd go get a core sample, it would go to the NIR, and the NIR would basically assess it for a range of things, most principally um, the proximates. But what you can do once you start getting, getting the calibrations developed, you can scan that information and then also assess the digestible value of that. And that really starts then being allowing you to actually formulate on actual digestible values of resources that you actually have in stock and are using, which means you can get a lot closer to the specifications uh, in terms of the, um, the how tight you formulate your, your feeds, which of course means you can then reduce your feeds, which of course means you then have less waste going into the system. So we've developed, Calibrations for feeds, whole feeds, so we can scan a feed and, and estimate its digestibility, and we can scan lupins, and more recently we've done the same for fish meals as well. Now, <coughs> excuse me, most commercial, big commercial companies already have this information, but this is information which we're working with the fish meal production sector on, so they, they can hopefully develop that capacity internally, so it puts them on a more even footing with the feed companies now in terms of being able to, to assess what they produce. After you've got that palatability information and digestibility information, now you're in a position to be able to actually do some growth studies because it means you can now formulate diets on a digestible nutrient basis and 
understand the palatability influences of it. The reason why I think that's important is that if you formulate a diet on a crude basis and then you get quite substantial differing digestibilities of the diets that you're made, now you're in a situation where you've got two variables. You've got an ingredient variable and now you've got a nutrient supply variable in the feed as well. And experiments that are simultaneously evaluating two variables are really difficult to get clear answers out of. So what I'd often argue with utilisation studies is, you know, the, the, these are the, the studies that you get to after you've done your foundation work. And there's no right way to, to do a growth study. There's better ways, for, depending on what question you're asking. But the clear here is to establish your hypothesis that you're testing. You know, what, what is it, the, what, what, what information are you really looking for in doing the growth study? You know, are you trying to understand what's the impact of potential contaminants or anti-nutrients in, in, in the feed or in the ingredient? Um, well, if you're going to do that, you better make sure that the feeds uh, um, uh, formulate a digestible equivalency on, you know, on nutrients to make sure that doesn't become a confounding factor. As a general rule, what I've found is that when you formulate diets to those equivalent digestible nutrient energy basis, then virtually growth nearly always correlates with feed intake. Um, but certainly, I just keep reinforcing this, you never start the ingredient evaluation process with a growth study because you'll, you'll end up with basically just misinformation. A good example of that, this is Stuart Anderson's work, his PhD work from the early 90s, some work evaluating different fish meal qualities in Canada. It's a great bit of, bit of work, actually. Um, so Stuart evaluated the digestibility of a whole range of different products and then ran a really cool study where he formulated them into feeds, um, but made the feeds at different protein levels, 40% you know, protein, 28, and about 16 or 17% protein. And then had the like a sort of a standard inclusion level of each fish meal in those different feeds. Now, when you assess that, that results from that study, looking at the relative performance in each case against the best yardstick, which was the Norse LT94 fish meal, which is 97% pepsin digestibility, what you can sort of see is as the protein got higher and higher in the feed, the difference between the poor grade digestible fish meal and, and the high one got less and less and less. And if you extrapolate that out, what you can sort of see is you get to a point up here at around about, say, 48% protein to about 55% protein, where you wouldn't be able to tell a good a good quality protein from a bad one if you if you included the feeds, the ingredients in those, those feeds. Ironically, this is actually the commercial composition of feeds for that size of fish that you'd be feeding. So if you were saying, oh, I want to evaluate my ingredient in a commercial standard specification feed, you would evaluate that in a growth study and your results would say, no differences in growth, this, this ingredient's fine. And you'd be wrong. Because what invariably happens when you commercially formulate a feed is you formulate up here at a point of excess supply of nutrients to make sure that any variability in raw material is not impacting growth. So that really becomes a very poor tool in terms of discriminating between quality is because you're losing that point of sensitivity in your design. And if you think about this in just in terms of Leibig's law, you know, the, the, the old whiskey barrel, that growth is only responsive to that first limiting nutrient. So in this example here, if I start playing around with the level of methionine, you're not going to get any response in growth in that study. It's only when you start playing around the level of lysine that you'll get that growth. In this study here, if I'm playing around with the quality of protein up here, of course it's not going to impact growth because the animal's got an excess supply of protein. There is different ways in which you can look at that complete replacement story, though. Um, and, you know, of course, everyone's been aiming towards this for the last 20, 25 years, examining how we can you know, make diets completely fish meal free. Um, and they're becoming more and more common. This is one I did with Barramundi about five, six years ago. What we noticed from that is, is that the complete replacement of fish oil had really clear impacts on intake growth and food conversion. Now, bear in mind that all these diets are formulated to the same digestible energy, digestible nutrient specifications. They're balanced for amino acids, essential fatty acids and everything. Um, we found that you know, in many respects that it was the fish meal that was the critical nutrient to removal. Uh, in terms of, of performance, and it was largely driven by the fact that the animal lost interest in palatability of the intake on it. So, you know, arguably that's one of the key roles that fish meal plays is that role of palatability. The other aspect of that was also the functionality. 
Um, because despite how good an ingredient might be nutritionally, if you can't effectively include it into a feed, it sort of diminishes the value. And an example of this might be that, you know, conversely, if you actually have an ingredient that actually improves the, the physical qualities of a feed, that actually increases its value. And the example of that was the work we did with lupins years ago. The the key point that got it adopted by scratching at the time was that by putting you know, even a small amount of lupins into their salmon feeds, it substantially improved the durability of the pellets as they were sent down these pneumatic feed delivery systems. So it meant that, you know, when Scratching was making feeds for Tassel or Hewan in Tasmania, and they were pneumatically delivering these pellets, they were in it with pellets coming out the other end rather than dust. So that was actually becoming a, a really key selling feature of, of that raw material. But there's a range of raw materials that can do those sorts of things. And some of them have a negative aspect on that, and some of them have a positive aspect on that. But there's other aspects and things like the expansion, buoyancy, um, oil absorption, water stability. There's a whole range of different parameters that you, know, you can evaluate here that add, add value to the ingredient evaluation story. And one example of that, though, was this is another bit of recent work that we did with um, Roquette, which is a, a grain processor in France, where we did a classic factorial two by two design, two different glutens, wheat gluten, corn gluten, and we cold and hot extruded it. And what was really interesting about this story was that that wheat gluten is largely unresponsive to um, hot extrusion versus cold extrusion, but corn gluten is, is very responsive. You can see that when you hot extrude corn, you substantially reduce its digestibility. It doesn't have any impact on the palatability, um, but the digestibility you can see over here, this is the extruded diets, and these are the, the cold extruded diets. So you can see digestibility going protein from 93 down to 69, just through extrusion. No mixed responses. So once you've done the, the palatability growth studies, um, part of the digestibility growth studies um, and functionality. The omics is something that you can add on to a growth study in some respects. And it's quite common to see various omics studies applied to lots of growth studies these days. Um, you know, I'm, I'm guilty as charged there of doing that too in some respects. Largely, I think it's because it becomes a form of entertainment for me, academics. Uh, the other common one to see is uh, microbiome analysis, which is becoming another popular one. Um, but certainly my, my view has been, I guess, shaded by that uh, over the years and that omics responses are principally responses to nutrient supply, not ingredient supply. Uh, so if you get your front end story right, your characterization, your palatability and digestibility, then you shouldn't be seeing many effects here. And so if you start seeing effects here, they're probably indicative of something else. Either you haven't got your diet formulated properly or where the omics studies can become a bit more useful is if you're looking for, say, things like detoxification genes or when you get perturbations in, say, metabolism from, say, things like um, anti-nutrients, um, that's where they can become a, a bit more useful in that regard. But by and large, for ingredient studies, mm, I'm a bit lukewarm on the application of omics. Meat quality is another one. Um, again, you know, we don't see huge amounts of impacts with different raw materials on meat quality. Um, with, you know, work that I did with fish oils about 20 years ago, looking at rapeseed oil and soybean oil and replacing fish oil. Uh, you can see you can get an impact there. It does impact obviously the fatty acid profile. We know that very, very well, but it can also impact some of the sensory aspects. And, and then things like comparing say bait fish with high, medium and low lipid in, in diets of sea bass. Uh, you can measure effects, but they're they're usually not not stark, and they were a bit bigger between pellets and bait fish. But um, within sort of things like lipid levels within within feeds, we weren't seeing very many big big impacts. So over the, the last 30, 40 years, I guess, when we look at what's happening in the the ingredient evaluation story and application story, we've we've certainly seen a a changing ingredient base, and this has really brought about some changing issues that we've got to face with. So in the early days, back in the, the 1990s, where our feeds were typically largely based on marine ingredients with small amounts of plant material and um, carbohydrates to bind them and you know some land animal proteins and things. And then during the period of change from 2000 to 2015, there was a big change in the reduction of marine ingredients, bringing in lots of plant proteins and plant oils. And then in more recent years, we started getting a bit more adventurous and bringing in some of the freaky stuff, you know, um, the insect meals and the uh, microbial um, proteins and things 
Um, it's really interesting stuff there, but I think it's, it's, it's important to bring to the table. But what we've noticed there during this period is ironically that change has actually increased the carbon footprint. And, you know, this week, of course, where I'm based in Scotland, we have COP26, the Global Climate Conference. And of course, this is a really big visible story at the moment with regards the impacts of animal production globally on the carbon footprint and what's going on there. So while arguably we went down this path, initially people have talked about sustainability. It's not about sustainability at all, really. It was more about finding more availability of raw materials to bring to the table, simply because the marine ingredient supply was never going to be able to sustain the, the enormous growth rates of aquaculture. But we need to look at going forward, what's our future going to be? How are we going to make our footprint green? And a lot of it comes down to use of this assessment strategy here called life cycle assessment, because we've got changing expectations of what feeds and what our food does now in terms of not only is it got to be low cost and nutritious, it's got to have you know, enhanced qualities, it's got to be safe, it's got to be responsible, it's got to be sustainable. You know, how, how are we going to feed, you know, 10 billion people by 2030 or 2050? without actually you know, needing a second planet to colonise somewhere. One of the things that's been clearly identified is in the process of feeding animals is that most of their environmental impact comes down to their, their feed. And this was some studies come out, coming out of the Norwegians about 10 years ago, looking at the carbon footprint associated with um, the use of feeds uh, about 10, 15 years ago. And you sort of see more than 90% of the the environmental footprint was feed related, and of that, probably around about 40% was linked to the marine greens at that time. Now, there's if you go back into the old studies, particularly in the life cycle area, there's lots of different rules and ways in which people have evaluated this on mass balance, on energy balance, or economic uh, allocation. But more recently, the EU um, and others have set up what's called the Global Feed Life Cycle Institute, the GFLI to try and standardise those rules and how we actually apply them and set up a centralised database. So that database is um, uh, set up now. Uh, and to use that as a common set of agreed values for different ingredients where people do life cycle assessment or try to calculate their carbon footprints. So that's, again, it's trying to understand that there has to be agreed rules when we, when we do these things. When we look at those rules and the way in which things are evaluated, you know, I'm pushing over now more into the, the marine ingredient side of the story. What we see actually is that most of the environmental footprint for marine ingredients is really driven by the fuel use during fishing operations. But if you see up here in this diagram on the right, this is the estimates of greenhouse gas emissions you know, over a period of about you know, four decades, oh, sorry, two decades, across you know, uh, six major fisheries. And you can see there, based upon the volumes of fish caught, and the, the global greenhouse gas emissions, the capture of small pelagic fish to make fish meal is actually arguably one of the most environmentally benign in terms of carbon footprint uh, sectors out there. It has almost no footprint in terms of its greenhouse gas emissions compared to the other sectors. And the reason being is that you're looking at large volumes of fish being caught by low intensity uh, diesel fuel use. Um, the, the, most of the fisheries are sane fisheries, which means they don't have to drag and net through the water to, to try and um, capture the fish. So things like demersal fisheries and crustaceans in particular, you're dragging a net along the bottom of the sea, which uses a lot of energy. But it's also this high catch per unit effort. So the fact that you're getting a lot of fish for that effort uh, means your, your greenhouse gas emissions per tonne of product is really, really quite low. The other aspect that's really contributing to this environmental footprint story with, with aqua, uh, fish meals and marine ingredients is there's really quite a growing production of byproduct fish meals and fish oils now. Uh, the 2020 data we're we'll looking at now, the, the bottom there, almost 50% of all the fish oil in the world now is coming from byproducts. Um, about 27% of that oil is from aquaculture, things like pangasius oil, salmon oil, and 20% of it's from wild capture byproducts, things like tuna oil and Alaskan pollock oil. There's still quite a lot of wild whole fish oil as well, but it's really almost a 50-50 split now for the oil story. The meal story, it, it's growing. It's around about 29% meal is now coming from byproducts uh, and 71% from um, uh, forage fisheries. But the really important part about why the byproduct story is really critical is that the accepted 
metrics now for environmental footprints is really based upon economic allocation. When we go to sea to catch a fish for human food, we don't go to sea to catch it the byproducts for fish meal. The allocation or the principal value of that, that cod that we catch, for example, is in the cod for human consumption. And so we can look at the split on an economic basis. How much is the value going to humans? How much is the value in the waste? And that's the allocation in terms of its carbon footprint as well. So when we look at that, you see these byproduct fish meals have really quite low um, environmental footprint. I'll get to that again in a minute. Fish oils are also very, very low in terms of their carbon footprints. Um, when you compare them against many of the other options out there, plant oils or animal oils, even some of the microalgal oils, they're really, really quite low. Um, and when we make these into byproduct um, fish oils, the footprint gets even lower again. And as we just mentioned, almost half of the global fish oils now coming from byproducts. Now, this is some data that I got from Richard Newton, University of Stirling, uh, from a colleague of mine. Um, and what he was able to characterise from some from data across different fisheries and different sectors was the uh, carbon footprint associated with different types of fish meals. And you'll see here, looking for anchoveta, blue whiting, capelin, and so on. That's the environmental footprint associated with the capture or production of the the um, the, the product in the case of the, the grains, the processing of the, the meal to make it into a fish meal, and also the land, land use change associated with those products as well. And you, you can see there that fish meals are really low compared to most of the plant protein alternatives. But when you compare, say, herring, herring that's caught for fish meal or herring that's caught for human consumption and then the byproducts are used, you have this massive reduction in the footprint associated with that as well. So what we're seeing increasingly now is that byproducts uh, or fish meal have amongst one of the lowest footprints. The issue, of course, we're facing here with the marine green sector is, you know, uh, everyone would like to use it because it has lots of good qualities in terms of palatability, digestibility, you know, it's sustainability in terms of carbon footprint. It's just a supply story. Or is that the case? Well, this is the projections by the, the World Resources Institute for where wild capture fisheries and aquaculture are going um, into the future. This was their, their, what was published probably about a, a decade ago. If I bring your attention to where we are now in 2020, aquaculture is certainly on track and wild capture fisheries are certainly on track with those predictions. In terms of wild capture fisheries for fish meal, we're still catching about 16 million tonnes globally, which makes about 4 million tonnes of fish meal and fish oil globally at the moment. And that's really been quite static for the last 10 years. So a lot of um, quota-based systems have been brought in for the major fisheries around the world for this area. Uh, that have stabilised that production, and we've seen stable production for about a decade now. And the forecast going forward is, is, is if we maintain that, uh, we should be able to, up to 2050, maintain 16 million tonnes of harvest to make 4 million tonnes of fish meal and fish oil. That's probably not a growth sector. But what we can see is all this part here is actually fish that's caught for human consumption. And we don't eat everything of fish. Fish, we tend to at best eat 50% of it. So there's always a fraction that is available for byproduct reclamation. The other big sector, of course, is agriculture here, which is growing massively. And of course, again, the same story applies. We we only eat half of what that production is. We could reclaim the other 50%, arguably, to put into um, byproduct production. Now, in 2020, we're currently reclaiming around about, um, I think it's about 2 million tonnes of byproduct. Uh, that goes in, into into making uh, extra fish meal. We're getting around about 770,000 tonnes of fish meal and fish oil from agriculture presently, and about 1.2 million tonnes from reclaiming the byproduct from wild fisheries, fish meal. But certainly by better capturing waste streams from both those sectors going on into the future, I can see by 2050, we could easily get 20 million tonnes of byproduct resource from each of those sectors, which of course then means that's at a four to one um, yield ratio, it means another five million tonnes of fish meal, fish oil we could be creating. So there certainly actually is the prospect for turning the tide here and actually increasing the amount of fish meal, fish oil we have into the future. It's never going to be the mainstay of the future ingredient supply, I don't think, but it will always be a strategic ingredient that has a critical role in um, influencing the way in which we use feeds and things like stimulating palatability and uh, um, providing that, those extra growth sparks that often carnivorous fish need. 
So in summary, um, ingredient assessment is really as much a study of the ingredient as it is of the animal being fed. And we need to take that into account. So to do that, we really need to look at the assessment in a systematic and structured way. Step one, you've got to characterise it. Tell us what you're working with. Tell us what it is. Tell us what its composition is. Tell us how it's processed. Tell us where you got it from. And then when you report that information in your in your study, then I can relate to that. The, the user can relate to that. As a commercial formulator, when someone would come to me saying, Brett, I've got a new ingredient for you to use. You know, I've got widget meal here. Uh, I go, fine, give me your spec sheet. I want to see the digestibility. What's your, where's your palatability data? Because without that, I can't formulate to it. Uh, if you give me the digestibility, the palatability and characterization, now I can start formulating with it. So that really comes to step two. So that palatability plus digestibility provides that basis for formulating. So anyway, when you've got steps one and steps two done, then you can actually properly do step three. You, know, you can now start looking at utilization or immune or functionality stories by applying steps one and two. And step four is really the you know, added value it's where you might be saying, oh, what else can we learn from the study that we've done if you've done it right? You know, what, what's the quality impacts? What are the omics impacts? You know, what's the life cycle footprint of this sort of thing that we're using? In terms of the marine ingredient story, the marine ingredients I see as remaining strategic ingredient, and they're going to have an important role in central nutrient supply and palatability stimulation going forward, you know, where the industry's done a great role in getting on top of this, is, this sustainability story within the sector to try and make sure we get improved sustainability of, of the fisheries and also beginning to better capture the byproducts for utilisation. And that's, I see, as a, a really key story and been recognised by a lot of the major feed companies worldwide now is that, you know, the 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 future of marine groups is shifting. They're now seen as a low carbon footprint resource and we can make it lower by increasing the utilisation of byproducts. And if we do it properly, it could even be a growing resource. All right, that's my summary story. I don't know if I pass back to you, Kabir, or Fanny, or Albert. Thank you so much, Brett. Yeah, it was a very comprehensive, very interesting presentation. Thank you. Yes, yeah, so we see that uh, marine ingredients will still be a very important ingredient or source of nutrients that can not will not be totally replaced uh, in the diets in the fish and free, uh, the aqua feeds. Uh, any before we go to the questions, Kabir or Albert, would you like to comment? I, I, I left it on Albert. Yeah, <laughs> you can turn up your sharing. Uh, sharing, I think, uh, Brett. Go to the oh, yeah. screen. Sorry. No, I. Re uh, a fantastic. I've got, I've got some other slides there in case somebody goes, yeah, Brett, but what about the sustainability <laughs> fisheries? So I've got I've got the data there. So I can have that, that conversation later if you like. Yeah. No, a fantastic presentation. I Thanks really so. liked it also that you emphasize the importance of digestibility. You know, because it's it's I mean the the very large companies formulate their feeds on a digestible amino acid basis. But maybe 80% of the world still formulates on a on a total nutrient basis, and so they have to overformulate, and in the end, the fees are actually more probably more expensive. But the important thing is, is you know, I mean, I remember back in '84, I did a a work where I compared external markers with internal markers, but using stripping because I agree with Brett. In the end, you know, it's it's uh, there's less very var variability with that method, but it's just. What's really, really important is that when we measure digestibility, we measure it in animals that are growing fast. You know, when we're testing a car, we don't test it in first gear. We test it in top gear. And on a farm, you know, the fat, you know, and most of the digestibility studies have been conducted, you know, in, in small tanks indoors. And so the values that you get are really very, are, are limited compared to what happens under the commercial under commercial conditions. So again, I really enjoyed your presentation and your your history of how you you come to the present day. Very good. Thanks, Albert. I mean, maybe you can, yeah, I, was, I was sort of thought, hopefully by, if people understand where I'm coming from, they might understand my reasoning for the way, the way I look at that. Because as I said, I, 
I've run into a few loggerheads with academics over the years saying, oh, Brett, no, you shouldn't do it that way. You're going to do it this way. Mm. Yeah. And that's, also, that's if I could, yeah, and also if I could say, you know, it's it's so easy to to write about nutrition or research in such a way that it's very difficult for people to understand. And one of the things I learned very fast when I worked with FAO, where you, what you say is translated into, into different languages, is that you have to write. You know, sometimes we have to present our information in a way that the public can understand. You know, not everybody is a full professor. Um, in the university, and at the end of the day, the the farmer, the private sector is, you know, it's a business about making money, and and sometimes we have to translate that that academic excellence into real world lingo, you know, that, yeah. that people can really under right. understand. I mean, I think it's so important. I've got an interesting story there for you, Albert. Very early on in my career, I think it's during my honours year, I was writing up a paper on my pig work. And I gave it to my father, who was a plant nutritionist by training. He did right. a lot of work looking at uh, various types of um, crops and pastures for, you know, uh, sheep and cattle production. Um, and I was writing this paper in this pig work, and I gave it to him to read. He meant, Brett, you're fitting into academia very well. You, you're writing in academic ease. And I thought, what? Yeah. Said, yeah, you've clearly you've clearly looked for the word, and then got a thesaurus, and then tried to use the biggest word to explain the simplest thing possible. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> I mean. Yeah, but that's the way academics write. I said, yeah, but no one understands them. And yeah. if no one understands you, your message is lost, and then your mails will not have done the work. Now, if you need a thesaurus, throw it away. Mm -hmm. okay. Use the first word that comes to your, your mind, because it's usually the right one to use. And if, you, if you're writing your paper to impress, then clearly your work's not very good. If, you, if, you're, <laughs> exactly. if, you, if your work's good, then you shouldn't need to write yeah. to impress. But may I have a question for, for both of you? Uh, that's... Uh, we talked about IFFD, right? In the end, database that we can use uh, for formulations, but there's not, nothing as a gold standard. But in your mind, right, what kind of uh, information online that we can uh, resource to uh, to get information on ingredients? Like small feed meals, they, small, like, uh, they don't have that database by themselves, so they need to resort to secondhand, uh, secondary information. So what kind of, uh, like in, in, in your mind, which sources or which sources we should be using, or should well, we use multiple sources? There's there's a range of resources out there, Kabir. Um, the the French, I think it's in CRD, have got a great yes, um, uh, Feedopedia website, yep. Um, yep. which gives you characterization of oh so many different ingredients. Um, there's, I think you, I, that, that book of yours, Albert, the one you wrote. Back when you do FAO, is that still available on FAO's website? But oh, yeah. FAO's got some great resources as well. Um, I've got just looking back, I've got that book of yours that I bought when I was doing my PhD that has <laughs> right, all the great like, compositions in it, like a Bible. In it. Um, I've still got that somewhere too. But the web's a fantastic resource these days. Um, Don Bureau's EAF had um, set up is, is a fantastic resource, so I, I, can't, I can't promote enough. Um, you know, it's got the digestibility information there, the composition information out there, specification information out there. It's really, really good. Um, increasingly, amounts of the studies being published now, they're all publishing as open access, which is, I think, a real game changer. This this uh, move to put in public information publicly accessible, I think, is a real game changer to the way we deal with science. Um, but most raw materials, if someone's selling a raw material, they usually got a specification sheet you can find it in the net as well. Yeah. And that'll tell you the composition. Like very rarely, you know, if I need to find that composition for widget meal or something, you know, I can search for it online. You might have to dig a bit, but you'll eventually find a specification sheet or an MSDS sheet. They'll have details there that you need. And, you know, start collating that information and compounding it. Um, you, you, you will find variability amongst different suppliers of different things. And that's why it's really important to that characterization step. Yeah. Um, but there is a growing number of resources out there that you know you can freely access um, to enable you to, as I was saying, you know, formulate on better understanding the characteristics of the material you're working with, understanding its you know, variability of digestibility, uh, and also the specifications that you need to try and formulate to to standardise that as, as well. 
Yeah, no, I support what Brett said. I mean, apart from you know Dominic Bureau's, you know the the database that he helped develop together with the American Soybean Association, yes. it's it's a great starting point. But in the industry, we all know that every single batch of ingredient that comes is different. And so, but what we have to do is, in, and and Brett alluded to this, is that we have to calibrate our nears, you know, with our curves where we can actually, you know, when a, a wagon comes in with a type of soya, we can, we can actually put it in the nears and then come up with a digestible nutrient levels, like we do with poultry. You know, in the end, aquaculture is just a few, you know, years behind in that respect. But um, but the databases, yes, they're very imp important. They're useful. The problem most of the time is that you don't know whether the digestibility has been determined under code extrusion or a extruded diet or a pelleted diet. And obviously, it's going to depend on the particle size of many things. But it's a great starting point. But at the end of the day, feed companies have got to develop their own digestibility protocols to measure the you know to measure the the characteristics of flex, you know the the variability of the ingredients because that's a, that's a given that's going to happen all the time to me i see this as i tried to lobby the australian uh, <laughs> center for international agricultural research about 10 years ago that this would be a major game changer if you know all that ODA work I was doing in Vietnam and Cambodia and Thailand at the time was that if we went around and got all the different raw materials and then evaluated the digestibility in tilapia, pangasius and barramundi and shrimp or something, and then actually scanned them, then you could you could actually keep samples of those raw yep. materials you do digestibility on to provide them with the data to, you know, you could rent you could rent them out effectively or sell sell samples. Uh, to actually cost recover that to a certain extent. So I, I, I can see that you could, you could very easily do this. You need to go through a lab that's got good analytical capacity, got good ability to... The thing about digestibility trials, to do them well is difficult. You know, the the yep. measuring the digestibility of a diet is easy. Measuring the digestibility of an ingredient, because of the multiplicative nature of the calculation, it amplifies error massively. Right. So you've really got to be on your game to be able to get meaningful information out of ingredient evaluation studies, which is why, you know, I think a lot of people don't do them is because they can be hit and miss uh, unless you really, you know, got a bit of experience in doing it. There, there's certain tricks you can do to get, you know, make them, make them work a bit easier. But that's what I think, you know, I've, I've always been surprised that Lucas Manomatis from, you know, from USEC in Southeast Asia hasn't set up a project to, all right, let's evaluate the digestibility of soybean products through species A, B, C, D, and X. And yeah. right, here's, a, here's, you know, you, you can actually get a reasonable calibration developed with you know, yeah. only a couple of dozen samples. The trick is you can't work with normalized distributed data sets. So when you, when you go out into the world and sample stuff, say soybean meal, it has an average composition, say D holds soybean meal, average composition are about 47, 48% protein. But you'll get sam samples up to about 55 and samples down to the low as 40. Yep. But they're most around about that, you know, in that bell curve shape, around about that 48. If you get 24 samples at random and measure their digestibility, you also get a bell curve for that distribution as well. And then when you try and develop a calibration of bell curve data, the curve can go all over the place because it's weighted by that massive information in the middle. So what you almost need to do is go through your data set. Um, and we can do this two ways. You can go get lots and lots of different samples, analyze all of them, and then, you know, over time you'll consolidate that information over a spread. Or you can analyze your samples up front and look for the, the disparate ones, the ones that are really high, really low, and a few in the middle, and then use those for evaluation. Or you can do like I did for the fish meal stuff recently, is you can go and make your own fish meal and mm -hmm. treat it with velvet gloves or you can abuse it. And then you end up with your high and low points as well. And that's sort of what we did with the lupin story. We we actually made lupin protein isolates and put them in there and made you know, lupins that were really badly treated and heat damaged and put them at one end as well. And that stretches that calibration out. But that's the key to getting a functional NIRS calibration working is to you need to work with squared distribution data sets, not normalized distribution data sets. And 
that just requires a, a bit of thought as to how you set it up yeah. from the outset. <laughs> a bit of expertise. And I think we have some interesting, interesting questions that we're talking. Yeah. from audience can we go through that? yeah i'll go through some of the questions and then we come Sorry. back on the digestibility discussion so from arif arifing rahman he asks if you heard of wax worms they are plastic eating worms and he's curious if they can be used to reduce the plastic problem and also be a candidate for aqua feeds my suspicion is, I, yes, I've heard of wax worms. Um, they eat waxes and other terpenoids, which are types of lipids. I don't think they, they might chew plastic, but I don't think they actually digest plastic. I don't think anything digests plastic very well at all. Um, so I, I suspect they're probably not a great way of actually reducing plastic load. All they're probably doing is turning macroplastic into microplastic into nanoplastic. Mm. Um, Maybe we so, have yeah, you might be able to use insects. To use. You know, I, I'm, I'm, I must admit, I, I'm, I'm not one who's overly sold by the idea of in, insect production as a, as a resource. Um, mm. And the reasoning for that is that insects are animals, they're invertebrates, okay? Like all animals, they use protein, they don't make protein. And most animals don't use protein better than about 50% efficiently. So if I feed an insect one kilogram of protein, at best, I'll end up with half a kilogram of protein. I then harvest that insect feed to a fish, so they're going to end up with 20, 50 grams of protein. So you actually got a, a trophic loss here. It doesn't make sense to me at any stretch of the imagination that we're going to be able to feed the world by adding trophic labels into our, our food production system. That just seems madness to me. So mm -hmm. while I, I know that the world's getting very excited by insect meals, to me, I, I think this is a step in the wrong direction. Because mm. some also want to feed food waste, so they... Uh, the stream of thinking is that you concentrate separate uh, various sources of food waste, go through the, you feed to the fish, uh, to the larvae, and the larvae will concentrate into homogeneous type of uh, protein. Yeah, I, I, I get that argument. I remember talking with John Dina, who was at the time, he was, um, I think, president or CEO of uh, AgriProtein in South Africa. He's back in Singapore now, I believe. And he was saying to me at the time, Brett, you know, after three years working in this insect business, it's a great way to reduce waste, but it's actually, you know, not a cost-effective way to make protein unless it's subsidised. But he was very much aware of that, of that protein loss story. I, I, I get the story about taking low-grade waste, whether it's food waste, restaurant waste, or even animal waste, mm -hmm. and you can buy turbate that with insect to try and recover the value of it. But the reality is, is that, you know, you're still losing protein. And there's actually other ways you can recover that protein. I mean, a, a simple example of that might be if I take food waste. So in, the, in Europe now, we've, we've, they've legislated for insect meal production and use into aqua and pigs and poultry now. Mm -hmm. But you can only do it on use of feed grade raw materials like DDGS and so on. Now, mm -hmm. that's not a huge problem because we've got massive amounts of DDGS in Europe from the brewing and the whiskey industry here that we can use that for. DDGS is around about 25% protein, okay? If I take a chemical engineering approach and I solubilize the carbohydrates by pH differential and then separate them through centrifugation, I can make a protein concentrate of 60% protein really easily from DDGS mm -hmm. and have a yield efficiency of about 80 to 90%. Yeah. So straight away, I've got twice the coverage, recovery of protein than I would have if I'd used an insect. And in the process, I've sterilised the process stuff as well. So this is where I'm thinking that I, I just don't see there's a reason for us to put insects in the story in, in here. Yes, you can use it to process restaurant food waste, but we can't because of sanitation reasons. We could use a chemical engineering process to use, do that, and that would sanitise it in the process as well. And you'd end up with more protein than if you used an insect as well. The only reason where I could see that you might think about going in the insect path was that if we can find that there's something in insects which stimulates the immune system or stimulates the quality of something. You know, it's it's that added value feature at the very end. Other than that, you know, we're only going to look at it on a cost effective supply of protein and energy on a digestible nutrient supply basis. And if you look at the processes that are currently being used, 
it, to me, it just doesn't add up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think it leads to something in my, in my head, but we have a lot of questions, I think. But in five minutes, five minutes, I want to raise a point uh, for, for, the, for the day for Albert as well. Uh, I think uh, the crisis we have right now, right, the moment, it's the logistics, transport, and raw material prices uh, increasing significantly, right, because of the transport cost. DCP was like five cents, now it's 50 cents, for example, per kilo because of the transport cost. So how can we address this issue locally, right? I think we, 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 can, we can come back to the fermentation, as you said, right, or uh, separation. To both of you, right, we, we need to develop ingredients locally, find ingredients locally or develop uh, ingredients locally to avoid these kind of situations that we are facing today. So last six, six months and probably it will continue until another year or two. This is for both of you, I think, uh, three, four, or three of you. Uh, this is kind of critical, I think, question of the moment. Uh, most countries, most food millers are facing huge, huge problems because of this. Okay. And farmers are suffering as well. Go ahead. Sorry. I could maybe just, I mean, lead into that. I mean, at the moment, Asia, you know, it's 91% it's of global aquaculture production. Most of the big aquaculture players, in which are feeding their their fish or the, or their shrimp, you know the the Indonesia's, Malaysia, Philippines, Thailand, Vietnam, all of them, you know, the majority of the ingredients they use still are imported. You know, so when we do our our life cycle assessment, obviously, the cost of fuel and transportation, <coughs> you know, those things weren't originally taken into consideration but obviously now the the price of a container is going up so much yeah. so obviously they're they're passing the the price along to um to the feed manufacturers no i mean the, the future you know and so that's why i think things like i mean i agree with with brett there's there is a a market for you know for insect meals i don't know how big it is you know because in the end we need millions and millions of tons you know as brett said you know our Aquaculture feed industry is 55 million tons. The problem is not today, it's tomorrow. And how we're going to, you know, source those ingredients. And so things like sing, um, like sing, um, SCP, bacteria, algae, yeast, where you can have a, a, a substrate, you know, and, 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 and the potential of, of, of generating protein locally using those technologies, I think are very, very, um, have a lot of future, but the you know, but the, the future is as I said many times, we have to produce more from less, less land, less water, less energy. You know, we have to become more efficient. But the problem for aquaculture is the same for the livestock sector; it's no different. You know, and so in the end, we're all going for those same resources sometimes. That's, well, I guess I'd reiterate what Albert's saying is that I have to talk about it is that we need to look at what's the non-competitive resource allocation. Yeah. And what I mean by that is that aquaculture, of that 55 million tonnes of feed that we're making now, marine ingredients supply about 5 million tonnes, of which about half of that 5 million tonnes goes to China presently. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, but most of that 55 million tonnes, 50 million tonnes of it, is is pretty much plant plant material. So there's huge resources used to things like soybean and corn and rice products going into that sector. But the thing about those products is that humans can eat those too. Mm -hmm. So we're feeding our food our food, which of course you know biological systems, you know, uh, other than plants and bacteria, animals use resources. They don't make resources. You know we we produce animals because it's a quality of lifestyle thing it's a cultural thing um, it's a sensory thing that we we like to eat um, but we need to be mindful of that this doesn't bring new resources to the table unless we change the way in which we resource that so the only things that we can actually produce that make new resources as plants and bacteria and as I mentioned there things like the single cell protein story and the uh, microalgal um, okay. Uh, oil story to me are, are real game changers there because the advantage there is that presently that brings new things to the table 
you know, we're we're not increasing the arable land. We're not increasing the freshwater reserves in the planet. The we've already passed peak phosphorus, which is a critical nutrient required for growing, um, you know, most grasses like rice and wheat and corn. Um, energy, everyone's familiar with what energy costs are doing. So the only way we're going to bring new resources into the table is to start bringing in things which we're currently not doing. And to me, that's the microalgal and single cell space. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. if we start doing that and that starts coming to the table, displacing some of the the plant resources we're using in the um, in the, the feed chain, that frees yes. up some of those plant resources for human food. Um, but then also adds into the aquaculture cycle, which, as I keep saying, that, you know, that, you know, of the fish that we grow, we only ever eat 50 percent of it. You know, there's 50 percent there biomass that we can we can reallocate and reuse. It become it comes a perfect. I often talk about what I call this, this this leaky nutrient cycle that we you can grow something like chickens on fish meal and then you grow the fish on the chicken meal. And all you do is you plug the leaky cycle by plugging it in with. Yeah microbial protein and some you know um microalgae and and, and some, you know, some marine greens occasionally sort of thing and it actually allows you to keep perpetuating that cycle and building it up all over time um but each time you also then use the fish as a biofilter from the from the poultry meal and you use the 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 chicken as a, as a filter from the fish meal so you're not feeding within systems as well so there, I, I see that there, there, there is clear answers here, but it's about how you integrate those systems, how you plug that, that, that leaky nutrient cycle because animals lose nutrients over time as well and how we keep that going. And, you know, I increasingly think, you know, that um, I, I used to always think like everyone else said, okay, the, the fish meal story is, you know, it's, it's going to um, become extinct. It won't. I, I, I see, see we've, we've turned the tide now. We're actually working out a way now to make better, smarter use of the resource. And we've now worked out we can increase that resource. And I can see, you know, I, I can't see any scenario where by 2050 we're going to have less fish meal today than what we have now. Uh, it's, it's you know, to me, it's been a really good time for my career to step from academia into somewhere like IFO because I think we're on the dawn of a new age. Good. Sorry, I shouldn't, I shouldn't try the plug too much. <laughs> no, no, it's, no, no. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So another question uh, from Rui Alexandre Gonçalves. He asks, uh, the influence of feed processing, especially extrusion, is sometimes ignored in the whole process of improving digestibility and palate stability, at least from the physical perspective. So also regarding sustainability, feed production is responsible for the huge amount of water use and energy. Shouldn't the sector look more to feed processing, not only as a way to make pellets, but also to improve certain feed properties? Could you share your perspectives? Who are you directing the question to? Me, Albert, Kabir? Um, I'm, I'm happy to go with that one if you like. Um, hi, oh, Rui. Yeah. Um, I was, I was Rui's <laughs> PhD examiner, so nice to see you. Just in there. Um, look, I, I, I did some work about 10, 15 years ago, actually. It was during that, that Lupin days, actually, where we had the same mash made up of through an extruder, uh, a, a Wenger X185 Mini, and a um, some cold press technology, and ran them head to head in the same experiment. And you get clear differences. I mean, they, they, they are they are generally correlated very well, so you can use one to infer the other, but you do get clear differences. And where it differs most is actually two points. One is the starch, the starch melt gelatinization story, but also protein to protein interactions. So where we got the poorest linearity and correlation was actually the protein digestibility, which is a bit of a kicker, really, because that's actually arguably one of the most important nutrients we formulate to. So it doesn't do that with all 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 nutrients. So, for example, that study that I alluded to in my talk about with corn and wheat glutens, you get different results depending upon whether you extrude or not extrude. So, wheat, wheat gluten is quite unreactive to temperature and extrusion, but corn gluten is. And it's largely because, well, corn gluten is not really gluten. It's, it's gliadins. They're different types of proteins, and they denature quite differently, and they form different interactions when they're heated as opposed to wheat glutens, which are gluten and pro proteins. Okay. No, I mean, 
I agree. Um, also, extrusion, you know, is very helpful also to remove some of those anti-nutritional factors that are present in many, you know, that the lower temperature processing cannot um, eliminate. And so, um, and also extrusion, you know, you have the potential of the Maillard reaction where you can yeah. maybe have the carbohydrate interaction interacting with some free amino acids. And so um, many people actually apply sugars to feed to actually bind those those amino acids there. Well, so the theory says anyway, but. Uh, yeah, but in, in the, pro well, the interesting thing about the Maillard process reactions are, and I've seen various iterations of this, is that sometimes it influences digestibility and other times it doesn't. So, yeah. for example, with the lupin concentrates that we made, going back about 15 years ago, we did, you know, spray drying, heat drying, drum drying, all range of different things to look at different, because it's the, it's the water removal process which drives the cost of making those concentrates. Yeah. Um, we found actually with the lupin protein, surprisingly, we didn't impact digestibility through Maillard process reactions. We could measure a reduction in reactive lysine content. So we, we had experienced Maillard process reactions there but they weren't imp impacting digestibility. Digestibility was very high at 90% to 100%. But what it did impact was utilisation. Because the, yes. the, reactive, the loss of reactive lysine means the animal can't actually utilise it anymore. Mm -hmm. And so we, we got that problem. Conversely, with, with say, fish meals, if you heat damage them in the presence of sugar, you, see, you do see a drop in digestibility. So different materials appear to react quite differently on the digestibility story with the Maillard process side of things. Okay. But but you 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 pick those up with, you know, a growth study in terms of the utilization side of things. Yeah, yeah. But of course, only if you then formulate the diets properly on the digestible basis in the first place. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. From Eng Kwan Seng, uh, can you comment on the importance of the difference in feed for different stages in fish? For example, fry versus fingerling versus juvenile. Who um, would like? Brett, Albert? Yeah, okay. Look, you, you, one of the classic things is that the relative rates of protein synthesis in small animals are much higher than larger animals. Also, larger animals tend to be much more focused on energy deposition rather than protein deposition. So as a consequence, what you get is this changing demand and ratios between protein and energy supply. What that means in layman's terms is that for little animals, high protein, lower energy density, big animals, lower protein, higher energy density. That, that's sort of how the, the physiology works. In terms of the way you apply that, that also varies depending upon what animal you're feeding with. So, for example, uh, a shrimp or a tilapia, they don't emulsify and digest lipid very well. So you, you can't really take a high energy density strategy to feed them. So what you do is you take advantage of the fact that those animals eat all the time and you take a low energy density strategy, which means you can then use things like starch as your energy source to bring in to supply the energy to then offset the nutrients. But you'll, you'll still find that with, say, a tilapia feed, you'll have high protein, you know, lower energy, and then for a bigger animal, you have lower protein, low to moderate energy as they get bigger. But for something like a sea bass, you'll start with high protein, low energy, you know, 55% protein, 10% fat. And then when you go to a three kilogram animal, you end up with, say, 40 percent protein, 30 percent fat in the feed. And th th those strategies work very, very well in terms of doing um, the way you manage that. The, the thing about energy density is that virtually all aquatic animals eat to an energy demand. Mm -hmm. The arguments out there with shrimp, whether it's an energy demand or protein demand, and, and I, I tend to be leaning towards protein demand. Alan Davis did some really good work years ago looking at drivers of intake in shrimp and it, it, his, his study seemed to indicate protein drives demand in shrimp but for most fish it's energy demand so if you say have, have a tilapia that needs you know um, 40 kilojoules per day to grow you could supply two grams of a 20 kilojoule feed or four grams of a 10 kilojoule feed and they'll largely eat that amount to satisfy that energy density so that that then of course influences fcr now, the thing about FCR is the FCR is interchangeable with feed cost. So long as you meet a growth target, you can interchange FCR with feed cost. So okay. the advantage of tilapia is you can make feeds really cheap, but you sacrifice FCR a bit by having that low energy density strategy. 
you know, with with a uh, sea bass, for example, they they deal with the high fat really well. So, but they but they don't like starch, so you tend to go the other way, and you use a very high density strategy That's to bring good. the FCR down, which drives the feed cost up a bit, but you sort of end up sort of in the same space to a certain extent. I, 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 I think, sort of answer that question. Sorry, I, I think to this, um, I think Brett. I, I read a study. How about training uh, the juveniles, right, to different diets, or to low protein diets, or high plant protein diets? There were studies in coming out of Indra, a couple of years studies, right, training the. I think if we change the diet at juvenile stage, when you change diet, normally we fed like high high fish meal diet the early juvenile stage, and then we reduce the fish meal level of animal protein, increase the plant protein, the grower grower diets. So the study is like if we train the juveniles, maybe we get lower, slower growth at the earliest stage, but they compensate faster. So they can utilize plant proteins better at the growth stage. Those animals which were fed based on plant protein diets at the earliest stage. So do you have any comments or ideas on this? There's a couple of studies from Indra, uh, France came out like that. If you, if you can train the juveniles or train the early oh. stage. Yes, the, so the nutritional the, programming story. Yes. Um, Again, I, I can't say I'm a big subscriber of the nutritional programming story. Um, yeah, you can measure basically the induction of certain gene expression events by introducing an animal to, you know, different nutrient supply. I mean, again, to me, the idea of looking at nutritional programming to marine resources seems a daft idea because uh, animals don't respond to ingredients, they respond to nutrient supply. Mm -hmm. If you formulate the diets properly, they should be equal in nutrient supply, but you can just do that from different resources. So usually when someone has gone and done, I'm doing a nutritional programming story to different levels of fish oil or fish meal, it usually means that they're dealing with just different supplies of various nutrients. It's not really an ingredient study at all. It's actually a nutrient supply study. When you see those responses, invariably what happens is if you decrease the amount of, say, omega-3 in the feed because you've decreased your fish oil, what you get is an upregulation of the expression of the elongation and the desaturation yeah, sure. enzymes. Because yeah. the animals just basically get recognizing, okay, I've got low supply of you know, my target I to, molecule. I to I'm going to upregulate the supply of my you know, production of my enzymes to make utilization yeah. of what substrates I've got to get where I want to be. So it's, right. it's not unsurprising to me. But in terms of using that as a, a strategy to make animals better adapt, Yes, you can measure something. And you know, Stefan Panserat and the guys at Inner have done some great work there in proving you can measure something. In terms of its impact commercially, I don't think it's relevant. Um, you know, I don't, to me, it doesn't make sense to push, you know, trout to become a starch metabolizing animal when all you're going to do is blow out SCR and, and you know, um, probably increase the level of adiposity in them because they can't metabolize the glucose effectively. Um, it, where, where, where it does get more interesting is that that same group did some really good work with Alberto Nunes um, on yeah. shrimp. Uh, Luis Leige, I think the guy's name was. Yeah. Uh, looking at basically, and they were doing more deprivation of nutrient supply at critical stages in the larval cycle of shrimp and then refeeding them and then how that actually stimulated the animal's metabolic capacity to reutilize nutrients down the track. That to me is more interesting. But the whole idea about fish meal replacement and using that as a, a cue for a nutritional programming to me it is not really a so coming well back to that idea, point think. that so if we if we use like low protein diet at the earliest stage, so animal can adapt uh, I think the grower at the grower stage. I'm just reformulating my question a little bit. That's okay, kind of then, then, then that that to me that has merit. Um, now, protein typically is the key driver of cost of formulations. So, if you can actually make an animal use protein more efficiently by some mechanism, um, then that that has real inherent value on it. Um, but presently, I'm not seeing many people take that focus, and that's that. I think something if we're going to get on this path of looking at. Um, epigenetic induction and its application of nutritional programming is it's how do you make animals better utilize and deposit protein rather than the ingredient story? Because if you formulate your diets properly, it doesn't matter where you get the ingredients from. You know, right. There's certain ingredients that are more helpful than others. Right. Um, but, you know, reality, in the, the day, it's, it's all about 
work, understanding what our ingredients bring, how we can work with them, and having as much available as we possibly can to decrease competition. Uh, two other questions. I think they're related. One is from Fernando. Fernando is asking about the correlation between growth and feed intake. So he, he said, uh, growth correlates with feed intake and growth is never the starting point. In other way, can we also say that feed intake correlates with growth? Is it like an egg and chicken question? And another one from Chun Wei Chen or Zheng Wei Chen. He asks, um, from your experience, how big an impact did floating or sinking feeds and even pellet size play a part in palatability? Even the way fish are fed during the trial may impact on the feed intake. Did you define a feeding protocol in your past studies? Let's start with the, the, well, the most, well, last question, because I've probably already forgotten the first one. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, we, 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 Sorry. Pal palatability studies are all about varying degrees of wrongness. Um, everything you do, I feel like nutrition in general, every experiment you do is wrong for one reason or other, you can argue. Um, but the key with palatability studies is to set up basically a standardised process and assessment and then use that as a metric for discriminating between treatments to provide information about what does treatment A do compared to treatment B and so on. So typically what I would do that is use standardised pellet size, that's critical. You also need to standardise feed delivery and feeding times, that's critical as well. Um, typically, say for example, what I'm doing with salmon, what I was doing with salmon in Tyler Sterling was that I was feeding for six hours a day, three hours in the morning, three hours in the evening. I was feeding from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. and then from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. by auto feeder when no one was around. I was delivering, you know, only grams per minute of feed, just trickling in. And it's critical, you always feed to excess. So you have to program the auto feeders to deliver out more feed than you think the animal's going to eat. And you collect the uneaten feed to work out what, what went in, what came out, the difference is still in the tank, in the animal. And you do that over an extended period of time to then start getting that information. Obviously, you know, the whole replication story comes into it as well. Um, so that's you know, how I would, I guess, approach that, that palatability story. There's other ways you can look at things like wire mazes for shrimp in terms of stimulation of chemoreception and things, which is critical for shrimp. Um, but that simple aspect of feeding an animal, exposing it to um, uh, excess supply, measuring intake effectively, as effectively as you can, and then using that as a discriminatory tool. It's also important to note with, if you say the way I was doing it, I often, I often pair my digestibility and palatability studies together. So I use that standard approach of a diet substitution where you make a, a reference diet, and then you replace 30% of it with your test ingredient and then you feed both, and then by measuring the digestibility of both diets, you can infer the digestibility of your test ingredient. But at the same time, you can also then measure the intake and palatability. So I tend to acclimate my salmon to feeds for a minimum of 14 days before I collect feces from them. And we've got data yeah. now that shows that you need at least 14 days to get things to stabilise in terms of digestibility. Um, but that 14 days also gives you a really good window to look into the influences of palatability over that critical 10 days up front. Mm -hmm. So you can you can still get two bits of information in one in the one study. The reason why you can't do that palatability much longer than that is that there's, there's different drivers which influence the palatability story or feeding tech story in, in fish. You look at a, a long-term long basis, we're talking about weeks to months, animals regulate their appetite based upon the responses with ghrelin, leptin and CCK um, and peptide tyrosine tyrosine in their, their brain-gut interaction, which is generally driven by energy regulation. Okay, so the weeks to month story is driven by the animal's demand for energy regulation. So if you get variable energy density of your feeds, you'll see the animal responding to that over the weeks to months time frame. In the short-term time frame, the, the minutes, seconds to days time frame, the animal's response are into principal senses, sight, smell, vibrations, taste, these the chemical cues. 
And that's where the ones that we interact with, so when we do the digestibility studies in those first two weeks, where you pick those up. And to me, that's the palatability story. So the, the palatability story is how the, the feed in influences those primary sensory aspects of the animal to interact with its food, whereas the formulation interacts with its dietary nutrient and energy supply story, which is the weeks to months time frame. Does that explain that story a bit? I, I think level of anti nutrients, sorry, level of anti nutrients or toxins in the diet also influence the yeah. feed intake, right? Yeah, and, absolutely. Uh, the, yeah. the, their capacity yeah. of absorption. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, just, just to add a point. That's why palatability is so important. But if you look at most experiments which are done by researchers or even by farmers, is that fish don't eat once or twice or three times a day or four times a day. You know, when we grow our poultry or our, our hogs, we have to feed there and the animal eats 24-7 when it wants to eat. And then it determines how much it wants to eat. Whereas in aquaculture, a lot of it is determined by the person feeding. Whether it's a researcher that, that wants to work, you know, during an eight-hour day or, or um, you know, so it's really important that the animal decides how much it wants to eat and the level it wants to eat. And so many experiments that you have a, a fixed feeding rate and and the diets are all over the place. And so at the end of the day, the, the result is just the way, is is because of the way the experiment was was planned. You know, it's and so an important point, again, just emphasizing what Brett said is letting the animal decide, you know, it's whether it likes a particular ingredient and at what level and, Anyway, it's just really emphasizing the, the palatability part. And the other important, you know, it's, it's day one of, of, of my lectures on nutrition is that is we look at the natural feeding habits of the species we're culturing. You know, for thousands and thousands of years, its metabolism is geared to a certain diet. So I always like to look at some of those old papers of the of the feeding habits of the of the species and how it feeds, if it feeds at night or during the day or you know, I mean, we can gather so much useful information from from these sort of studies. Anyway, it's the same. Yeah, thanks, Albert. I was just going to add to, to what Kabir sort of said about the during that palatability fight. I mean, anti nutrients tend to operate by three key. I mean, think about what anti nutrients are. I mean, they're, they're chemical compounds that plants have evolved through millennia to basically avoid predation. You probably noticed that when plants get predated, they don't, they don't run away very effectively. So they take a chemical warfare strategy or physical warfare strategy. They use spikes or cactuses, or they use chemistry to actually try and avoid predation. But that chemistry into fact interacts with either the palatability, the digestibility, or it impacts with the utilization, usually the metabolism. And an example of that is the palatability, like uh, alkaloids, you know, the, if you ever get like a, a, um, a lupini bean and you get one that hasn't been soaked in brine and you suck it, it is bitter as anything. It'll suck the water out of your head. It says, yeah. okay. okay. Um, trypsin inhibitors are a really good way of basically interfering with protein digestion. So that's another classic one from, say, soy. And then uh, the, 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 the isothiocyanates from, say, rapeseed or glucosinolates, right. they're breakdown products. They, they basically interact with, say, the, um, the thyroid metabolism. Thyroid. They don't regulate you know, metabolism. So there's key, three key points by which anti-nutrients interact that you'll pick up the palatability one in your palatability assay. You pick up the digestibility one in the digestibility assay. And the third one, that's where, to me, where you get the best outcomes from growth studies is looking at the impact that things like anti-nutrients have on utilization or the the impedance of utilization and, and that's that example there so the uh, the, the glucosinolates story and there's some great work from uh, christine burrell's phd going back in the, the 90s it's a really good work with and when um a phd in france with sachi kashi looking at that influences of those uh rapeseed meals and how they Im impacted metabolism and, and growth as a consequence of that that's really cool okay. Really appreciate the discussion. Yeah, okay. so the first question was the, <laughs> the girls. I'll talk to you after you get it. <laughs> the girls' correlation with, uh, with feed cor feed feed intake. Yeah, feed intake. So does feed intake correlate with growth? 
it is it is it is a classic chicken and egg question so uh, a bigger animal has a greater energy demand therefore it demands greater energy consumption um what you'll tend to find when you do a study like that though if you do it properly is you start off the experiment with all animals of the same size and therefore your animals basically are coming from a common size base so you're taking that that initial point of variation out of the study therefore what you look at is the changes of feed intake then driving the growth and how that departs over time so if you go back to that study i showed at the very beginning of all those different diets formulated with different raw materials to the same digestible protein and energy basis we started with you know, barramundi the same size but then over the course of eight weeks they grew very differently and it was linked to the fact that some ingredients they liked more than others it was a very strong palatability driving response in that study but what you find now is that if you um if you know how to control palatability and there's some really useful tools out there in the marketplace now that allow you to do that you can you can override some of those key factors and that's that to me is another where you know story which i see coming into how we manage feeds and feeding into the future is that how you learn to control and manipulate palatability yeah so that's you know if, if i was staying in academia um that that would be my my two key points to focus on in the world is how you can understand and control palatability and how you can understand and control digestibility. Sort those two out, got 90% plus of your equation already sorted. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I think we, because we have still other two questions and then I think we finish the Q&A and then we can discuss one a bit more if on other matters if you would like to. So one is about the price of insect meal because it's now currently is more than the fish meal. So what's what's the future possibility to bringing down the price? This is from Gameje Pereira. Do you ever go that one, Albert? Uh, I mean, I heard. I mean, I uh, visited a, a plant, a feed manufacturer in. Um, in Germany that was using insect meal in some of their koi carp feeds. But it was, you know, it, at the moment, very expensive. I mean, you're talking between five, ten dollars a, a kg. And, it's, and, and st until we start getting tonnages produced, you know, we and and the prices start going down, then it's, uh, it's still a very expensive product. So uh, if they can sell, right, put insect producers sell insect flour at ten dollar a kg, why should they sell as a feed ingredient, right? So that's another thing we can see a lot of uh, enriched enriched flour in the market with insect flour. So that's another point, right? So we may we may uh, have option to use the core products coming out of insect meal industry. Not I mean the core. The cool thing about insects is it depends on the substrate you're using where you grow them on. If you if you grow them on a substrate like fish processing waste from a marine waste, then the you know the omega three content is within the animals is is much higher. You know, so obviously the substrate you use is is going to play an important role. But obviously, if you have an aquarium industry which will pay top dollar for the product, then the industry will move that way. Um, you know, but for sure, it's 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 a product that's going to become more on stream in the future. But at the end of the day, you know what nutritionists are looking for is the beautiful thing about fish meal is that apart from having a, a really good amino acid profile, you have you have calcium, you have phosphorus, magnesium, iodine, right. um, vitamin A, D, choline. You know, you have a whole. A whole suite of of of, in, of nutrients. Nutrients, and so sometimes you can have a cheaper protein source, but what else does it deliver? You know, and so um... the other one you missed, you missed it, Albert. I was, I, was, I was quite happy letting you do a good good sell job for there for me, mate. Um, was the palatability story? You know, one one of the, yep. the key reasons why people have found it difficult to replace fish meal is that. You can formulate a diet on digestible nutrient supply and energy supply fine. 
And then when you drop the fish meal out, the animal loses interest in eating the feed. And for example, about 20% of global fish meal supplies are presently used in the pig sector. And it's used basically to transition from um, you know, the weaning into creep feed. And it's about basically um, just shut that down. Um, it's about basically making sure that the animal gets attracted to that feed to actually take it on and uh, and consume that. Um, it's, it's, it's the same with fish, and to me, that's one of the key aspects that we don't quantify that very well. Uh, yeah. we, we can measure the nutrients, we can measure the omega-3, we can measure the protein, but what we've found very difficult to provide a clear metric for is the palatability response. And this is where, I, you know, what I what I would like to see somewhere in the world developed is a, is a palatability index. Um, you know, and I'm not clear in my head exactly how that methodology is going to work. I'll think about this one for a bit, but we need something that says, all right, you're relative to, I know, ingredient X, your palatability is 110% or 120% or 80%. And then that gives the information to a formulator that, right, if I add all these things in, what's my net palatability effect to actually understand what the potential influence could be of different ingredients on the net feed intake result of the feed? But to me, that's sure. that's a that's a complex one that needs to be needs to be developed. But that's another project with someone out there to have a look at. All right. Wouldn't wouldn't it, wouldn't it be better for palatability issue to identify the chemicals? I know we already identified some chemicals that can affect positively or negatively the palatability, and then we can look for this these those chemicals in those ingredients. How about building the database, right? I think we we have some it's, information. Yeah, I do have lots of information. Um, when I was at Ridley, we did lots of work in looking at understanding the palatability drivers of a whole range of different hydrolysis that we were using. Um, yeah, hydrolysis. And what you'll find is that the key drivers for, say, barramundi are different to salmon or different to shrimp. They, these animals, you know, Albert made the really good analogy before. If you look at what an animal's natural habits are and its trophic level and where it sits in the food chain and what its behaviour is like, you'll see that um, they, they actually are responding to different cues, okay, and they're different drivers there. So what you'll find is the molecules that actually respond to us are quite, quite different. The boss trying to ring me for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> um, the what you you'll you find there is that they've got different cues they're trying to trying to um, drive drive that story. Um, but it's also not just one molecule. Mm -hmm. There's there's what we we found with that work is that there's there's interactions and com combinations things that seem to influence it. It's it's not just one thing. It's this is why I keep saying that if I was staying in academia, this would be a, a key area to work at. What are those key drivers that influence short-term and long-term feed intake, and how can you understand that better? Because it's 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 a it's a whole area of the, the nutrition story that's not really been well encompassed yet. I don't think. No. So the last question is: feeding is still largely based on feeding the animals a certain percentage of their body weight daily in a commercial farm. So, do you think there's a better approach to quantify the feeding amount? So, Ida, <laughs> who would like to take this question? It must be your turn, Kabir. No, I'm I'm done. <laughs> no, I'm not done yet. I'll work go ahead. <laughs> No, again, I mean, I've, I've already Nothing. said it, that, you know, I mean, animals don't. I mean, with farmers, we have a we have a feeding table sometimes that the, that we use as a, as a guide. But, you know, in the in the terrestrial livestock sector, we let the animals decide when they want to eat and how much they want to eat with aquaculture, because we, you know, it's 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 harder to do. But it's something that the salmon industry has learned to do using video cameras and, and different uh, Keys. you know technologies but you know the important thing is that we have to you know develop you know we have to let the animal decide in terms uh, of you know it's it's feed intake rather than the the feed applicator 
I, I agree with that, but from farm, farmer's experience, right? When I when I talk to a farmer, what what is their experience is, but there is a uh, I think there is a cyclical approach in terms of feed intake, right? It's a sign of said, oh, so you see one day they feed a lot, and the next day the feed intake drops. And I think the farmers, uh, most farmers, uh, know that's this cycle. So if if they can follow this cycle, right, that uh, the, the 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 level of feed intake and then time and date, I think the management can be much better. Another approach is what I talked when I when I say uh, what I say to farmers that if you want best FCR, you have to feed animals between seventy to eighty percent of the prescribed feed uh, prescribed amount between 70, 70 to eighty percent. That that's at that point you get the best FCR. Maybe the the, the the expected growth take two or three days uh, more, but you get the best FCR when you feed them at 70 to 80%. The only the, problem with that is how do you define what's 100%? Yeah. Well, I don't know, that's a prescribed amount, right? You have, if you have like say 3% three, 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 three of the body, body weight, you put like 70 to 80% of that amount. The problem with feed tables is if you feed to a feed table, you'll get the prescribed growth. But how do you know you're not constraining growth? Yeah, and the reality is, is a gram of growth. Growth, growth is a, a, a um, you know, it's a discrete process. So if you lose growth today, you will struggle to get it back up tomorrow. You might make some compensatory response, but you won't get right. it all back. And so every feed opportunity you lose is actually mm -hmm. performance loss. And this is I, why I, you know, I, I made that made the the comment before that. The salmon industry started off with yeah. feed tables, but then moved to the process of using those as a guide. And then they're now using basically a lot of these, you know, uh, modeling algorithms to actually predict what the animal needs. And that's largely driven by an energy demand process. But then they're still using observational behavioral responses to work out, do we drop that down to minimize wastage? Or is, is an yeah. animal actually in a, in a hyperphagic state and actually wants to eat more? So let it have it, let it have its way, eat it a bit more. You, you might find that your FCR will deteriorate a little bit once you go above a certain threshold, as you as you point out, but the animal still converts. It still converts very efficiently. Yeah. And that growth that you don't get by missing that feeding opportunity, you, you'll struggle mm -hmm. to get up, you struggle to recover down the track. So that's why mm -hmm. there's a real push to try and go beyond the 70 to 80% to get higher and higher and higher and higher as much as you can. Because the shorter you can make the production period, of growing an animal when you put it in the water to get it out i mean you, you only make money when you put it in the bank so the money's not made until you actually harvest the animal and get it out so if you can decrease that time period you then already got all the savings in you know um all, all the capital exposure and the 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 risk that you have associated with the animal still being in the water that you can minimize by getting it out sooner right. and in some cases get another crop into the same infrastructure again to increase your throughput be like paying off your mortgage, paid off monthly, paid off fortnightly. You save a lot more money if you paid off paid off fortnightly. It's the same strategy with growing animals. Too. So how, That's how, right. how, how can you explain the the practice in Vietnam uh, with with Basa uh, that after seven hundred grams they feed once in two days to set IT. <sighs> I think it might to do with basically the, the throughput of the digestion and how quickly you can get the animal to empty its gut to get the next lot into it. Yeah. Um, I think that there's, there's a, you've only got to cut open a bassa, you know, after it's been grown to a kilo and, and have a look inside its gut to tell you something, it's not quite right with the formulation. You know, this thing's got things that look like breast plants inside it. Um, you know, this huge, massive abdominal fat lobes. Yeah. Um, to me, that's really indicative of basically excess energy supply. So you've got more energy than nutrient. And when the animal gets that ratio wrong, you know, animals find it difficult to excrete energy. Right. So they deposit it. And pangasius doesn't tend to deposit it intramuscularly like a salmon. It's intraperitoneal. It yeah. Right. Yeah. Very good. It's very interesting discussion, but it's been over two hours. Some yeah, people so are. <laughs> we have 15 yeah. minutes over. But. Yeah, we could go on, but I think some people need to go to bed. <laughs> some of you go to bed. Some of us just starting the day. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, I think 
I, if any of you, so if, so if you had uh, less comments before we end this session, uh, Kabir, Albert, Brett. You can start with Brett. <laughs> I think the important thing is that Brett's presentation will be available to the participants, if that's okay yes. with you, Brett, you know, but because there was so much information in that. Yeah, the, the, the slides will be shared later on after we send a feedback form. So everyone who responds the feedback, we send the slides in PDF format and the link for this session is also because the session is recorded, so it will be available in a couple of days there on LinkedIn and also on AIC website. Yeah. Okay. Okay, you will find it YouTube channel as well. Of, uh, oh yes, of, sorry, the YouTube, of, uh, YouTube, YouTube channel. Yeah. And I appreciate everyone. And then one thing, like uh, for next time, I think what I I feel is that some some people like misunderstood the timing, the time because Singapore four p.m. So they they logged in at four at their four p.m. Right, Thai people they logged in like an hour later. And I was seeing like from Bangladesh two hours later, some people were logging in. So it's kind of a uh, sorry for this inconvenience again. And we'll try to yeah, make it we, better in future. We tried, we write during in the, but I think it still confuses people the time. Some people, some people <laughs> yeah, but it's all, all, always at 4 p.m. Singapore time, if you remember. So from next time. <laughs> sorry. Yeah, but thank thank you, Brett. I guess. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it was very special. great. Yeah. All right, guys. Love the chatting. I better go see what, yeah. my, see what my boss wants. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Answer the Take call. Care. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank Brett. Bye, -bye. Kabir, Bye, guys. Albert, Bye, everyone. Yeah. Thank Bye -bye. you. Bye -bye. Thank you all. And thank you, Rongshin, in the back. Rongshin, yeah, yeah Bye -bye. and the audience for staying so long. <laughs> thank, yeah. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye. 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 Bye.